Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to day four of the 11th Sustainable Innovation Forum. I'm Nick Gowing. Uh, I'm the founder and director of the Thinking the Unthinkable project. All week, we are asking with the decision uh, to, we make today, will it realign us to the Paris Agreement and the 2030 emissions reduction targets? We have two specific horizons, let me remind you. We are here to discuss and build on the next 12 months, taking us to COP26 in Glasgow this time next year. And what about the decisive action and convergence points that have to be met over the next decade? Well, day three was about uh, transport and sustainable mobility. You can watch all the sessions on demand. Mighty announced their Plan Zero playbook live in the studio. That's for net zero for all their facilities management by 2025. Yes, four years from now. The BMW Group joined us live from Munich, sharing their thoughts on the future of the industry, particularly on sustainability. Who wants to drive and what will they be driving? Our closing panel with the mayor of Helsinki and the former mayor of Vancouver, where they shared their urgency on redesigning urban mobility. And there was one fascinating idea of the 15-minute city, where nothing takes longer than 15 minutes in an enormous city. Well, um, what's today about? It's about industry transition. Well, let me underline that last graphic you saw there in case you might have missed it where it flashed past. We're here to showcase innovation. We're about building momentum. We're about raising ambition. We're about shaping policy and also enabling partnerships, bringing you all together, even if it is virtually like this. There are five days looking at five different sectors, and here they are on the graphic here. We started with climate policy and finance on decision making on day one energy transition on day two, day three, yesterday, sustainable mobility, and we had an extraordinary series of sessions with the youth agenda, underscoring how the next gen is so worried about what is happening and what, there's what, what is going to be left for them. Today is about that industry transition. And tomorrow, day five, Friday, 20th of November, land use and agriculture. We'll have a contribution from His Royal Highness, Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, and also the Governor of California, Gavin Newsom, particularly after what is happening uh, with now the shift in Washington between Trump and Biden, and also after the terrible fires in many parts of California back in August and September. Now, let me explain what is behind me here. It's the climate clock. There you can see it reading seven years, 42 days, and 22 hours and a bit more, 26 minutes as well. This is the climate clock. It represents the total amount of time we have remaining at the current levels of carbon emissions, the current levels of carbon emissions before we reach irreversible climate tipping points. That is chilling. It's not 2030 or 2040, it's 2027. 
and it's going to be there all this week, a reminder of the urgency of this emergency. So today is about industry transition. It's about decarbonizing the hardest to abate sectors. It's the hard to abate sectors returning to business as usual. Will they return? return to business as usual after the pandemic? Or will they account for the entire carbon budget in the year 2050, as is predicted? That is the deeply chilling addition to that one clock and what that is signaling. Will they consume the entire carbon budget by 2050? In other words, that's why they have to be abated and they have to be abated quickly. What do we have in store for the next three hours? First, we'll hear from today's industry partner, Drax. Their new decarbonized technologies are already being applied and scaled right here in the UK, helping industrial clusters continue to operate while reducing emissions. We'll hear twice from the global chief executive, Will Gardner. He'll be joining us live from New York City. And so please, if you've got comments or questions, particularly about CCS, then please uh, start filing them now, and I'll give you the details in just one minute. Then we have a virtual panel moderated by Oliver Johnson from the Swedish Environment Institute. What are the key milestones and convergence points that have to be met to get these industries on track for net zero in the next decade? The first uh, break will be 20 minutes. Um, that'll be halfway through the three hours. And then we're joined by the UK Minister of Energy, um, Kwasi Kwarteng. Uh, and he'll be raising the issue of what happened yesterday with the announcement from the British Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson, about 10 new pathways to greening the UK economy. We can get much more live from the UK energy minister. He'll be joined by industry leaders from Tata Steel, from Johnson Matty, and Peritals Technologies to discuss where the technological pathways are taking us on the way to decarbonization. Finally, joining us live, IEA's Executive Director Fati Barol. Uh, he'll be joining us from Geneva and Sweden's Deputy Prime Minister Isabella uh, Lövin to discuss the market implications for innovation, the importance there of innovation. That's what the IEA is saying at the moment and policy regulator interventions. First to Lee Jong, who is Director General of the UN Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to join you today at the Industry Transition Dialogue of the 11th Sustainable Innovation Forum. A focus on industry and its role in accelerating climate action is of the essence here, given both the scale of impact from industrial activities as well as the innovation potential and the capabilities within industry to change course. I want to emphasize the opportunities to change from the current industrial system and a transit to a future net zero emission industrial system. Today, industry still accounts for one third of the global greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, industry is still a major contributor to economic prosperity and employment accounting for almost one-fourth of a global GDP. Making the transition to a net zero emission industrial system will present unique opportunities for industry despite the challenges in both developed and developing countries. We are very much aware of the delicate balance that governments need to strike between the necessity to achieve industrial growth targets and the commitment to net zero climate targets. I strongly believe that this balance is achievable and the industry can lead the way through sustained decarbonization measures. Excellencies, in UNIDO, working with our mandate to advance inclusive and sustainable industrial development, we have seen firsthand the possibilities for aligning industrial development with low carbon pathways, while also becoming aware of the challenges to enhance industrial competitiveness. This transition requires systematic and sustained efforts calls for consideration to explore all possible pathways 
for the decarbonization of industry. We believe that low-cost energy efficiency measures, integration of renewable energy, digitalization and circular economy approaches can deliver a substantive share of the decarbonization target while keeping in mind that the full potential of such measures has yet to be exploited at scale. A more demanding task will be decarbonizing the energy intensive and hard to abate sector like cement, iron and steel. Even here we can see promising innovation and alternative fuels for conservation such as hydrogen. The key challenge here will be spurring demand for low carbon or green commodities such as cement and steel at the end user side. Given the risks and the costs associated with the deployment of such advanced decarbonization technologies, industry will be reluctant to make the needed transition without strong demand signals. A leveled playing field needs to be established through the common standards and internationally recognized certification schemes for green commodities as induced demand will not work on a country by country basis. Excellencies, coordinated efforts at the global level are needed to spur demand for green steel and cement and incentivize the investment in decarbonization technologies in the hard to abate sector. Here, we must leverage the willingness of the private sector to offer solutions and provide them with incentives that foster long-term social economic resilience and sustainability. UNIDO remains committed to working with the governments and the industry to advance coordinated efforts on that front and catalyze sustained action for the decarbonization of industry. Thank you. The Director General of UNIDO speaking to the Sustainable Innovation Forum. Uh, let me tell you a bit about Climate Action, if I may. Um, established in 2007, Climate Action unites the public, private and NGO communities through digital and live platforms, digital like this, virtual, that's the way we have to do it these days, to advance the Paris Agreement. And the forum has been around for over a decade. Uh, this year, it's part of the um, COP16 to COP26, that roadmap. That's what we're looking at. That's where the Sustainable Innovation Forum is at 2020. And that's uh, where we'll be a year from now. And if you want to be part of this uh, global um, map and the roadmap to COP26, then please get in touch with Climate Action to find out more, uh, to help the planning process for COP26. Let me um, now thank all our partners, officially supporting the Race to Zero, that's what this forum is doing, as part of London Climate Action Week. Uh, BMW are the headline partners. Uh, they have been headline partners for six years. Uh, we heard the Vice Deputy, the Vice President uh, for Sustainability and Mobility join us from Munich live yesterday. Uh, the industry partners are uh, the strategic partners uh, well, the industry partner, first of all, is Drax. Uh, they uh, will be talking to us again shortly, twice. Uh, and they're doing all this work on net zero in industrial clusters, particularly around the Humber here in the north of England in the UK and many other global projects as well. There are also three strategic partners today. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Group, the uh, GHD SAT, and also Johnson Matty. So we're grateful to them for all the work that they're doing and supporting today's output. But let's hear, first of all, the first of uh, two interventions from Will Gardner, who's global CEO of Drax, today's industry partner. Hello, everybody. My name is Will Gardner, and I am the CEO of the Drax Group. Drax's purpose is to enable a zero carbon, lower cost energy future. And in 2019, we committed to a world leading ambition to become carbon negative by 2030. 
It is therefore a great pleasure to be opening day four of the Sustainable Innovation Forum, focusing on industry transition. Today's discussion is happening on what would have been the last day of COP26, had it gone ahead this year. The delay due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted all of us in different ways, should strengthen our resolve to make COP26 a success. Our collective global response to COVID-19, rapid adjustments to working practices and business models, record speed in developing treatments and vaccines has been impressive. We must and can do the same for the climate emergency. And there are reasons for us to be optimistic. Many countries have adopted ambitious climate objectives. South Korea pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. Japan also committed to a 2050 net zero target. China stunned the world when it pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. And the USA will be rejoining the Paris Agreement in early 2021. We must emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic with clear plans for a green recovery that work for our climate and environment, that deliver opportunities for our communities. And this is particularly important for our industrial sector. Decarbonizing heavy industry is perhaps the greatest climate challenge. The issue is more pressing than ever before, but we are also better prepared than ever before to meet this challenge. Scientific bodies such as the IPCC have been able to develop pathways for industrial transition. We have also made great strides in deploying some of the technologies needed for decarbonizing heavy industry. There is consensus emerging that hydrogen and CCUS will be needed. It is also clear that negative emissions technologies will have an important role to play. In the UK, for example, industry is likely to be one of the larger residual emitters in 2050. And those emissions will need to be balanced by negative emissions technologies if we are to achieve net zero. Drax is pioneering the most promising of these technologies, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, BEX, at our power station in the north of England. Using existing technology and long established practices from different areas, we aim to deliver carbon negative power by 2030. BEX permanently removes CO2 from the atmosphere while producing renewable electricity. It uses biomass from sustainably managed forests that absorb CO2 from the atmosphere as they grow. BEX delivers negative emissions because more CO2 is stored in the forests and in geological storage than is emitted. CCS will work best if the infrastructure for transport and storage is built at an industrial cluster where heavy industry is concentrated. BEX projects can be the anchors for those clusters and help de-risk CO2 transport and storage networks by creating economies of scale and reliable volumes of CO2 for the network operators. Deploying BEX at Drax Power Station, which is located in the Humber, the UK's largest and most carbon intensive industrial cluster, would accelerate the decarbonization of the region and the industries located within it. Drax could become an anchor for the cluster permanently removing as much as 16 million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere each year, a significant proportion of the 51 million tons that will be required annually for the UK to reach net zero by 2050. Drax Power Station has a proud history of transformation. We were once reliant on coal, but now are the UK's biggest renewable power generator and largest decarbonization project in Europe. To us, it is clear that to rise up to the challenge of climate change, it will not be enough to simply maintain momentum. We must accelerate it. We need to work together to deploy the technologies that will not only minimize emissions, but also support the sectors that cannot do so as much or go as fast as others. This means seeking cross-sectoral collaboration to scale up technologies such as BEX, CCUS, and hydrogen, but also to work with governments to foster the right regulatory environment that provides us with the certainty needed to invest in these technologies. Decisions need to be made now so that we can prepare and deliver on a positive future. At Drax, with the right regulatory framework, we aim to have BEX units in operation well before the end of this decade. The, the time to act on our climate ambitions is now. Let's make the next 12 months count and welcome delegates from across the globe to COP26 
having made real progress on this critically important issue. I look forward to today's discussions. Thank you. Executive there of Drax, and he'll be joining me live from New York in about 40 minutes. So if you have questions or comments you want to put about the big projects they're working on, please start filing them now. Let me tell you that this is being recorded, uh, and uh, therefore uh, you can get every session in the last three days and today's sessions and tomorrow uh, on, the, uh, on the website. Watch on demand at any time. Visit the virtual uh, expo all this week, and uh, you can network and connect all this week as well uh, through the website. And remember to bookmark your, your sessions that you want to see and want to be reminded of. Let me tell you, tomorrow on Friday, we will have a contribution from His Royal Highness, Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, and also Gavin Newsom, the, uh, the governor of California, talking about the fires and also the pressures building on, uh, on Washington now and what the new reality will be with uh, President Biden from January. Uh, how can you post questions? How can you post comments? Well, the, you go to the live discussion button on the platform, click on the questions, let us know your organization, and uh, maybe who you'd like the question to be put to. Let's go ahead with the first panel now. We have 10 years to decarbonize the heavy industries. Can it be achieved? Let's go live to Stockholm to Oliver Johnson, who's head of the unit for climate emergency and society at the Stockholm Environment Institute. Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, and welcome to this panel session uh, where the real focus is going to be on that question. We have 10 years to decarbonize heavy industries. Can it be achieved? And so we've heard there's a there's a real urgency to, to act uh, within the heavy industry sectors. If we look at historical transitions, industrial transitions, energy transitions, we know it didn't happen overnight. These things take a lot of time. It's like a big ship trying to turn it. You really have to start now and it takes quite a while. And that's because our, our industrial systems, our economies are so interconnected uh, and, and change that happens, it, it needs to ripple through the system and that takes time. So when we're thinking about building back better and of course in those economies that still want to industrialize just building better we need to think about what can we do now in the immediate immediate term the short term the next 10 years to ensure we can reach those ambitions that many countries have for being net zero uh, by 2050 uh, or 2060. so we've got a great panel uh, to discuss this and I'd like to introduce them now. We've got uh, Mindy Luber, the CEO and president of Ceres. We've got Rana Gonem, the chief uh, of energy systems and infrastructure at Unido. We've got Stéphane Germain, uh, president of GHG Sat. And we've got Kate Height, principal for, uh, at Rocky Mountain Institute. So welcome to, uh, to you all on this panel. It's great to have you here. And I'm gonna start with a very simple question. We have 10 years to decarbonize the heavy industries. Can it be achieved? So I'm gonna start off with uh, Mindy and if you could just keep your uh, answers brief and that will set us off in, the, in our discussions. Mindy, please. Great, well, good to be here. Uh, sending regards from Boston here in Massachusetts in the United States. And I will start by saying I'm optimistic it doesn't mean the question can be easily answered or we could get there. We know we are on a race. This is all about pace and scale. It'll take a number of things to get there within the 10 years as we're talking about. The first thing is we must have policy changes. Business can do a lot on its own. There's no question they can and they will uh, and we'll see progress. But we've got to have a clear mandate starting sooner rather than later that says you must use these kind of resources um, and the government will only purchase these kind of resources. So policy at a number of levels. First, we do need the right market signals. We need to put a price on carbon. 
Right now, carbon pollution is going into the air, costing us billions of dollars, and we're not pricing that. So if it costs more money to use polluting products, uh, people will look for something else. So we need the right market signals, I would argue, uh, that's price on carbon. We need mandates. Look, every continent, every country around the world is looking at building back better. We're going to see $10 trillion with a T going into new infrastructure, building out of COVID, creating new jobs. We could spend that money on the fossil fuel economy that we're living in today, which we know is a catastrophe, where we could design those programs to be about building out a better future, where you must use different cement, you must use different steel. And if we're going to allocate resources with the government's dollars, which means our dollars as the public, we need to put mandates on how those dollars ought to be spent. Secondly, companies. Companies need to want to use the right resources. Again, if things that are polluting are more expensive, people use the other, whether it's consumers or large companies. Companies want to be more sustainable. They are setting goals about getting to a net zero future by 2040. We need to help make sure that they get there. We know their consumers want them to get there. We know their employees want them to do it. And we know their investors do. But we've got to give them the tools and they'll help create the demand. So when they're building buildings or new office parks, they will use the right resources. Then the investors must start investing in the right technology and not the wrong technology. We're seeing more of that. Uh, but again, to get the innovation and the right technological solutions, we do need government subsidies, incentives. The fossil fuel industry has been incentivized for 50 years, if not more. Let's make sure we're doing it with the industries and with the technology that need to be incentivized. So if all of those things happen, if we have the right policy, if we have the right standard for what's legitimate and steel, um, we can create the demand uh, the demand will be there, and I think we can move this industry um, to a new place. The final point is, it can't always be a company by company effort. We've heard about terrific models over the last couple of days at this climate action conference. We need to move sectors. Sometimes one company by one company is not enough. We need to bring the players in the sector together and move those sectors. Uh, governments in important role, has an important role in this, and I don't want to underestimate that. Thank you very much, Mindy. Passing over now to to uh, to Rana, how would you uh, respond to that question? Ten years to decarbonize the heavy industries, can it be achieved? Well, certainly that is not an easy question, but I would say it's not even the question at the moment. I think that that clock ticking uh, that we just saw is was very powerful to me. It just leaves us with no option but to look into how can we achieve that because we can all feel really the climate emergency uh, as much as we feel also the uh, uh, the pandemic emergency that we're all facing. But for us to really look at what needs to be done now and how can we uh, achieve that, I think we need to keep a couple of facts in mind. Um, we know that half of the industrial emissions that are uh, come from energy intensive sectors like iron and steel. Uh, we know also that the production facilities in these sectors are actually lifetime investments that go for up to 50 years. Uh, we know that the innovations that uh, are uh, that we need more innovations to actually come up with technologies that will help these uh, sectors uh, decarbonize. And we also know that price remains the uh, predominant factor that really influences as well the competitiveness of a lot of these uh, 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 commodities in the global market. So for us to really uh, work towards helping these, uh, these companies and these sectors to decarbonize, we have to think of how do we create the demand for um, 
green products like green steel or or uh, green uh, cement so um, basically from our perspective what we really need to work on and focus on is creating an enabling environment by first of all developing a common uh, product benchmark that really defines how green is green uh, what does it mean to be uh, uh, you know purchasing a green uh, uh, steel uh, on the other side we need to give also the companies that are investing in the uh, technologies today and really bearing the costs additional to their uh, production, making their uh, products a bit more expensive on the market, we need to also <coughs> help them secure the demand for their products by creating uh, better and more alliances among buyers, be it buyers from the uh, public sector or be it also uh, buyers from the uh, private sector. And finally, also, we need to all, uh, kind of uh, follow foster a debate uh, around uh, what uh, incentives do these industries need uh, to embrace the change that is needed. And um, uh, basically there, there's also the need to look at what do the uh, sectors in emerging economies uh, need as well because some of these innovations are also many of them are happening in the uh, developed countries so some of the concerns that we hear from uh, uh, these sectors working in uh, emerging economies is will we have access to the technologies that are being developed and tested in the more developed countries and there we also need to make uh, sure that uh, we help industry by providing sort of a readiness assessment of these technologies but also helping with transferring some of these technologies uh, to the emerging economies which remain also critical um, to achieve this decarbonization um, so yeah i would say it is possible and i would remain optimistic although the times ahead of us at the moment are not as uh, optimistic but uh, uh, the question is how can we do it and for sure together and with a lot of collaboration uh, we can certainly achieve that thank you rana uh, i i'm picking up both from yourself and mindy some some things i'm going to come back to Let's keep going. Uh, Stefan, how about yourself and uh, your experience working with, with, with companies and governments uh, on, on measurements? How, how, what's your feeling about whether we can, we can do this in 10 years? Well, like Mindy and Rana, I, I'm optimistic. Uh, but major steps can and must be taken now. And with enough scale and scope of action to really have a short-term impact. So, so to get there, I believe in three basic parts to the answer. The first is measuring performance. And measuring performance is absolutely critical to achieving decarbonization. Direct measurements of emissions from all heavy industry is possible today. And that kind of direct measurement levels the playing field for all players. The second thing is that Markets have to reward good industrial performance with premiums for low carbon products from heavy industry. These premiums can be created and sustained if there's a reliable measurement method and, and approach uh, for emissions from all sources. And these emissions then have to be tagged to units of output. And the third and final thing is governments must reward and be rewarded for policies which accelerate decarbonization. So investments and incentives exist today and will continue to be provided for converting industrial processes from um, high carbon industry to low carbon industry. Um, but you know, investments and incentives that are there today for high carbon industry really have to be refocused now. Uh, there's, there's far too much of that that still exists and, and needs to be transitioned. So systematic reductions in emissions um, from heavy industry can and must be tracked, but must be measured in order to ensure the pledges governments are making and the pledges that industry are making um, really are, are, are understood and, uh, and, uh, and really uh, monitored. So that's, that's, I think, the three key things that make up the answer that we're looking for here. I, I am optimistic. I do think that large scale decarbonization is possible, uh, but the extent to which that possible really is going to depend on how well we can measure it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to dive into some of those things in a bit because I think there's uh, definitely uh, uh, some interesting things to, to probe further. Kate, 
What's your perspective on this? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Oliver. And it's lovely to be with you all today. I'm joining you all from outside of Washington, D.C., where we're very much looking forward to some upcoming changes in January. So just building on the remarks of others, I mean, this is going to take a really a whole ecosystem approach to achieve this over the next decade. So we're talking about a really a number of levers that need to be activated simultaneously to bring about this change. Um, and the way to do it <laughs> is to make sure that we have industry agreed pathways to achieve those reductions, pinned to those pathways, which are really modeled exercises, technology exercises. We need to have roadmaps of discrete actions that industry is going to take and that the ecosystem of actors, including finance, including demand, including government, are going to take to support those changes. And we need to have metrics to measure progress. And this gets to Stefan's comments about being able to sort of track um, the greenness of products and to Rana's point about making sure that we are stimulating and supporting um, the production <clears throat> of such, especially in developing economies where that production is just beginning. So I think that what we're going to see over the next decade is a continued effort by industry to think about concrete solutions. We're going to continue to see this trend in finance to not only support investment in some of these new green technologies, but also divest from some of the more polluting technologies. And we're going to see these buyers clubs coming together that are demanding better products, building that demand and helping bring the price down. All of this, as Mindy stated, must be undergirded by robust policy. So it's really this sort of feedback loop of ambition that we need to get going so that we can continue to ratchet up government commitments under the Paris Agreement, but also implement policy on the ground that's supportive of real action by industry in this decade. Thanks, uh, Kate. And I think that really nicely tying everything together in that picture of the, the sort of ecosystem where multiple things have to happen and, and achieve that ratcheting up of ambition. And as one one action or and one lever gets pulled or pressed, it kind of influences the, the, the next. And I think that's, that's important. I'd like to pick up on a few points. I think, Stefan, you, you highlighted this, well, and, 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 and others as well, this kind of linkage between the the measurements and the perform the, the the measurement and the uh, and the premiums uh, for those that, that when you measure products that are greener and that, that you have metrics for that and and so that takes me to to two sort of questions one Rana how green is green right because that's what you mentioned we need to we need standards for how green is green because this is so integral to sort of setting sort of benchmarks for then premiums on products and so on. And I think what's happening in that field, and maybe uh, I don't know if you could respond to that, but also Stefan, what's happening in, in the development of those standards? Are we getting anywhere to sort of really understand how green is green steel and, 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 and these types of products? So maybe uh, Rano, could you, or well, jump in, go for it, Stefan. <laughs> sure. So I, I actually think there's no simple answer to how green is green and that you have to uh, try multiple approaches to get there. Um, so first, uh, there's, uh, ex there's lots of um, approaches that exist today for uh, looking at carbon credits, for example, and defining the quality of various carbon <clears throat> credits. Uh, and some are regulated and some are voluntary. And uh, the, the, the quality of those credits really depends on the uh, different institutions and the, and the reputation of different institutions that are backing the certification or the quality of those credits. I think that's one good effort. It's an important effort, but I really don't think it's enough um, to, the, to the point a few of us made earlier that we need real size and scale and scope to this effort. Now we have to try multiple levers. So I think the ultimate lever is actually the market and uh, providing enough data to the demand side of the market to really understand where their um, heavy emissions are so that they can then uh, vote with their dollars. They can decide where they're going to buy products that truly are lower carbon um, and having enough transparency and data available such that they can make informed decisions in that way. And this isn't necessarily only consumers, this is industrial buyers, government buyers, uh, and 
a systematic effort to for the demand side to really um, understand how to buy green. And then finally, I think on the supply side, uh, the in industry has to understand enough about their own emissions that they can get feedback on the amount of decarbonation that they've succeeded in doing. So they've obviously they've got direct feedback from their own projects and how they are progressing, but they want to know how they're progressing relative to their whole supply side of the market. So relative to their competitors, benchmarked against their competitors, so they understand how the market will respond, the demand will respond to the amount of supply that's available for low carbon products. So that kind of transparency and the availability of measurements globally and uh, the changes in emissions in their sectors is critical for industry to really understand uh, where the premiums will be and how big those premiums will be. So I think to summarize, I think some of them can be uh, mandated. I think some of them can be defined through uh, the quality and, and volume of credits available and by setting prices for carbon and so on. But I think really the market is ultimately the best mechanism for valuing that's balance of supply and demand. And we have to provide the data to both sides to be able to really define in reality that balance and get to uh, the true value of, of what green is worth. Great, thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, I've got another question, but would anyone else like to, to, to jump in on there or I can follow on with my next? I could just uh, just to, to briefly, sure. I, mean, I can't agree more uh, uh, on the issue also of transparency, as I mentioned also earlier. I mean, competitiveness remains a, a major driver for yeah. much of these. Uh, and these are global markets that we are talking about. So we need a universal uh, system that kind of helps with the, with the benchmarking. And that is not available. And the uh, availability of data uh, on, uh, you know, the different processes, the different technologies, the carbon emissions of these industries is critical. So we need to really work together on this uh, harmonization uh, of these uh, products. And uh, I guess one uh, point as well to, to mention in looking at the technologies is um, we also need to uh, look into how some of these industries are using approaches related to circular economy and uh, scrapped, uh, you know, that is entering also into their production. So we're not only uh, talking about efficiency or renewables or hydrogen or CCUS, there's also a big dimension to drive this green agenda. And there's a strong need to uh, define, you know, this common benchmark. And to my knowledge, there isn't really something that is uh, tackling all these at the moment. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rana. Mindy, I'd like to pick up on something you mentioned, the role, the right policy. What, what types of policies are we talking about here? If we go a bit deeper, what, what types of policies could we be using uh, to, to sort of provide, whether it's market signals or whether you mentioned government will only purchase, what, what are we talking about here? And what, what tools do governments have? Uh, governments have an enormous amount of uh, options for how to incentivize and use some tools. And now is the moment, I would argue, today, yesterday, tomorrow, are more important than any other moment in time. But let, let's look at what some of the options are. One is we do need to put a price on carbon. We want to disincentivize high carbon emitting products and incentivize those that are responsible and clean and able to get us to where we go. So we need to look quickly at putting a price on carbon. That may be hard to do in the United States um, short term, but we will be certainly pushing it. Secondly, government has an enormous amount of research dollars and other incentives, even without an act of Congress. I mean, we know that it will cost billions of dollars to get certain technologies to scale or refined, whether it's carbon capture or other things. Industry needs to be a major part of that, but government, the Department of Energy and others can incentivize that, put resources into design, development, <clears throat> and they ought to. The third is building back better. Again, there will never be a moment, another moment in time, I believe, in our lives when we see $10 trillion globally being considered for whether it's jump-starting the economy to get out of COVID, uh, whether it's under one Build Back Better banner or another, 
10 trillion dollars is unheard of that money didn't exist six months ago it's being manufactured by the federal reserves and the treasuries it's being brought into the market we can spend it in a way that locks us in right now to the old technology or we could spend it in a new way when those bills are being debated those dollars are being considered if we don't tie them to the kind of technology we want to see, we will lock ourselves in to the present economy and it will lock us in for decades and decades. So everybody needs to focus on what whatever country you're in, whichever continent it is part of, those dollars are coming forward. We need to make sure they will decide which way we go. And then finally, um, we have standards in the United States and there are elsewhere for what kind of washing machines we buy and what kind of cars we buy and what kind of standards, uh, fuel economy standards, energy efficiency standards. We can and must put standards on these kind of products. Uh, the science can be done. I'm not a scientist, I'm a lawyer, uh, but I know it can be done. Um, and we just need to decide what's a legitimate standard if in fact we dictate that people will come to the party, meaning technologists will develop the right cement, the right steel, and so on. And then finally, the government. President-elect Biden has said he wants every agency in the United States um, to be living by a climate regime, a climate standard. The number of cars bought by the United States, the number of um, the procurement is almost larger than any industry in the world. So we need to make sure that every purchase of the United States says, we, we are building out the next 400 roads. We will only build it with this kind of standard and not with a dirty. The opportunity is now, it's immediate, and it requires us to focus like a laser, but it can be quite game changing. Thanks, Mindy. And I wanna follow up on that, the last one on, on kind of, Public green public procurement and 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 uh, ask you, Kate. You mentioned buyers clubs. What what are these buyers clubs, and how do they fit into that kind of the, that kind of regime? Sure. So I mean, this is something that people have been talking about in policy spheres in the private sector for a number of years now. So one of the problems that we have um, in industrial decarbonization is we have this sort of chicken or the egg problem, right? We have a number of globally competitive industries that are um, producing competitive products that are moving around the world, um, very much driven by lowest price. Um, we have a number of consumers who are very interested in, in procuring greener products. They don't necessarily have the transparency needed to be assured that they're actually getting what they're paying for, right? Um, and so what we're thinking of here when we talk about buyers clubs is getting together those governments and consumer groups that would be, you know, heavy industry, say the auto industry procuring steel, right? Coming together and saying, okay, we are committed to procuring greener products. How do we work collectively to set a standard that we can agree to is an appropriate standard for a globally traded commodity? And how can we communicate to industry that's manufacturing the products that we need that this is the standard they need to play by, right? And so this standard could be a voluntary standard in some instances, but really, as Mindy was stating, it will really only take off when this standard is pushed by governments, right? And we have seen this in the US with standards for renewable power, right? The renewable power market starting off on sort of a voluntary basis, um, credit-based trading, um, power purchase agreements, but then really taking off when these sorts of um, standards for green power were embedded in state and national policy. So I think that's what we're hoping to create with buyers clubs is really leveraging the power of the market to send a signal that sets a clear playing field for what is needed, what is acceptable and what is not. And as we ramp up the amount that's demanded, the price comes down. Okay. and and. The Thanks. That that's, was really, really succinctly explained. And I'm just wondering then, do you think for in the industrial uh, sector, heavy industry sector, 
we need to start with that kind of voluntary and then ramp it up is it is it about sequencing is it about kind of as you you did mention ratcheting up does that kind of how you would perceive this I mean, I think it really very much depends on where an industry is at a given moment, right? Some industries really have the attentional regulators right now. Um, so let's take the example of in Europe, there is a lot of attention on the oil and gas industry right now and methane emissions associated with production of natural gas in particular, right? So in that context, certainly there are some voluntary standards out there that define what is acceptable in terms of natural gas production and associated methane emissions. But as the European Commission considers embedding such a standard in policy, that's when it's really gonna take off, right? So I think um, it doesn't need to be sequential. It can be in parallel. In some instances, it may be ready to go directly in a regulatory context. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm getting some uh, questions in from uh, from our audience. So I want to take some of them. And the first question I want to pose to Stefan is, can you give some examples of how measurement has led to action on decarbonization from your experience? Absolutely. So um, I can point to uh, a paper we published, a peer reviewed paper. Uh, in 2019 about a measurement we took in Central Asia of a very large methane leak that uh, one single leak uh, in a relatively difficult part of the world required some uh, support from three different ambassadors to get this leak shut down. But at the end of the day, represented over a million cars taken off the road per year, one leak. And we know that there are dozens of these kinds of leaks around the world today. And we work directly with either the industrial emitters or with their governments to work to have those shut down. So I think we're getting very close to having another example that uh, involves Central Asian and Chinese cooperation to get another leak shut down um, just within the next month or so. That'll be of a similar magnitude. So direct measurement for even in extreme cases like that can lead to concrete action with major impact. Now, that, those are specific examples. If we look at things more systematically, there, the systematic monitoring of emissions from uh, whether it be the steel industry, the aluminum industry, from the cement industry, uh, from the oil and gas industry, uh, in regions where they're known to be significant emissions, whether that be in the coal mining regions, regions of uh, Northeastern Europe, for example, or whether that be in the oil and gas production regions of uh, New Mexico and Texas, in the United States, for example, or in uh, Central Asia. So sustained monitoring of those regions leads to uh, faster identification and faster action in getting leaks, unknown or unexpected emissions shut down. That's particularly, rela particularly related to oil and gas, or in providing transparency in some of these other markets, especially with where carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is involved, so that each of the different players in a market in steel or aluminum or cement, for example, are well aware of each other's emissions and can agree amongst themselves or have government's mandate standards that reduce their total emissions and then allow for uh, markets to take over on who's gonna buy greener cement or greener aluminum or greener steel uh, and who's gonna have the supply of that. So those are, uh, short-term and longer-term examples of, of where there's opportunities for measurement to drive significant reductions in emissions. And I'd like to, well, follow up on that. In, in the, the, there must be a bit of a, po a politics wrapped up in this. Is there resistance to measurement? Do you, do you, how do you handle that? Or how do you work with that uh, potential resistance to measurement because of concern for what it will do to a particular industry? I'd say in the last two years, there's been a, a dramatic change in the perception towards measurement. It used to be that there was a bit of resistance and a bit of voodoo or magic involved in you know who's measuring what and how, and can you really compare apples with apples from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. But in the last two years, especially with the advent of satellite measurements, it's become much harder to um, hide, frankly, and in that there's been titles of several uh, high profile uh, 
uh, publications in the last year that have emphasized the point that really today, in the age we live in today and, and going forward, it is anywhere in the world is no longer possible to hide from the kind of emissions mm -hmm. any individual industrial facility can can produce. So um, I think that there's a significant change now in attitude. I think there's an acceptance that measurement is here and yeah. that it's only going to get more pervasive and persistent everywhere in the world. Great. Thanks. That, very, very interesting. Rana, I want to turn to you because there, you, you, we know that the emerging economies uh, you know, have a lot of rapid growth expected in, in, in industry and industrial emissions. So a lot of the attention is often on, on uh, how do we transition existing industries and industrial base. And in many cases, they're in uh, developed economies with a maybe a wealthy um, uh, government budgets to support and, and so on. Uh, how do we how do we address this and, and support emerging economies to to embark on industrial transition and and manage that technology transfer that you you'd spoken about ensure that they're uh, they're part of this uh, this this process and and not left behind in that sense yeah thanks for that question oliver indeed uh, i think uh, uh, it's a quite an important topic to be focusing at uh, looking at the emerging industrialization and uh, emerging economies but even in across the african continent we see that there's quite a lot of uh, countries that are working towards setting up uh, industrial zones and industrial parks and there is a need really to look from the beginning on building those uh, with a low carbon uh, infrastructure and there's quite a number of ways for us to do that so uh, standards and I stand again at the risk of uh, being repetitive here but making sure that we have right standards uh, for uh, those uh, uh, countries to consider uh, for the infrastructure so this, uh, the development of uh, infrastructure guidelines for low carbon <clears throat> industrial development, that is an area which is also uh, very close to our heart at UNIDO and which we believe uh, has uh, quite a big role. That's the first. Uh, second is the capacity building uh, element. And there actually there's quite a lot, a lot of uh, uh, importance for the climate finance that is coming there uh, actually to support uh, in building the capacities both within industry, within the service uh, sector that that supports industry and also among the policymakers to be putting you know those roadmaps that uh, uh, were mentioned by Kate as well there is a need for supporting this capacity building notion at different levels in uh, developing and uh, emerging economies and then the third angle is more developing those partnerships between uh, private sector um, also between the developed and developing countries to make sure that we are supporting the technology transfer uh, at the national level. So forging these level, uh, these partnerships that can promote uh, the technology transfer among the private sector uh, is something that is uh, also uh, quite useful. Thanks, Rana. And that, that it takes me on to a question I wanted, uh, was posed by uh, one of the audience uh, to, to particularly to Mindy on, on partnerships and international collaboration. How, in, how important is international collaboration on climate policy to create enough? Well, how, how much, how important is that in creating incentives for heavy industry to decarbonize uh, everywhere, not just in the developed markets? Well, look, the world has become a global market and any large company is, the, whether they're, um, whether their headquarters is in Boston or in Geneva or in Bangladesh or in Beijing, uh, we're a global world right now. And unlike almost every other environmental problem that most of us have worked on, whether air pollution, water pollution, lead poisoning, all of those are local problems, huge problems that need our attention. But we cannot solve greenhouse gas emissions. We cannot solve the climate problem without a global approach. It's not going to be exactly the same. What our different governmental bodies do will be different, uh, but we have to look at this in a global way. It, the demand for cleaner steel or better cement, um, it has to be a substantial demand. And we want to make sure that any company that's a massive global company is bringing the resources or the commodities to the market 
in a way that satisfies all parts of the world. Now, there's different nuances. What's needed in Africa, what's needed in certain parts of India is a different energy mix or a different mix of things, different highways, different buildings, different structures. Um, but this is a global problem. And the more the solution is global, the better. It doesn't mean we won't have nuanced differences in our countries. Uh, but governments need to be somewhat consistent. We're seeing financial markets become more consistent on how they look at climate change. We're seeing global companies respond differently. Um, and we need to look at both metrics as well as definitions that are fairly similar, if not perfectly aligned. Thanks. And uh, Kate, then, yeah, jump in, please. I'd love to add on on what Wendy was saying because I really couldn't agree more. I mean, I think the the key theme that's undergirding all of this is that individual industries themselves need to align around what the pathway is to net zero by 2050, right? Right now, we do not have agreement among <laughs> major industrial actors in different geographies on what that pathway looks like and what those actions are that need to be taken over the next decade and then over the next 30 years after that, right? So that is a really key thing that we need to work on as a priority over the next few years is to bring industrial leaders together who have articulated that they wanna make commitments to decarbonization and say, okay, what does that mean in terms of concrete actions you're going to take? Once those industries have agreement around what those steps are that they need to take, this is where finance comes in to support that, both in terms of investment and the technologies that industry is saying that they need. This is where policy comes in to both support those investments and send the signals on the demand side to get those products in. So I, I think that that's something that we really need to um, as a community focused on industrial decarbonization, come together to support industry in making those sorts of commitments and in aligning around the same vision, because it is only when industry leads and goes to their policymakers in these different geographies saying, look, this is the playing field that we need. Could you please support it in us, support us in it, that that's going to really level the playing field and enable these globally traded commodities to really be traded on the same basis. Thanks a lot, Kate. I, I'm conscious of time. I think we're going to have to wrap up. So I'm going to I'm going to propose one last question. And I know we've had a few questions we haven't been able to get to uh, from from the audience. One uh, particular on on sort of the behaviour change. And so it's a shame we haven't had time to get to that. But I think that's of, often a, a question on on how sort of uh, the public might need to change their behaviour, and, and and we need to think about the way. Uh, we consume, for instance. But I'm going to ask you all this final question. Well, two questions, two parts. One, are you still optimistic? And two, what, what one thing do you want to see happen by COP26, so in the next year, that, that can catalyze that action we need within, within the next 10 years? Just short, 30 seconds each, that would be great. Stefan, do you want to start us off? Well, so yes, I'm still optimistic. Let's start there. As, as for the one thing, I, I, I think you've heard today that it's actually, it can't be just one thing. It's got to be a broad and scaled action. But if I were to pick one thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat what Mindy said earlier. How often in the history of the world has there been $10 trillion of new money available for governments to incentivize the right actions. So um, I, it, I would say if there's one thing between now and next year that is going to happen is the definition of how that money will be spent. And there's an opportunity now to make sure it gets spent in a way that it decarbonizes heavy industry. Thank you. Rana. Well, I guess joined by so many optimists, I'm only more optimistic at this point. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, the one thing very difficult to pick, but I guess it's actually uh, creating this uh, public private debate around the standard for uh, green products. And what does this mean also for uh, developing and emerging economies and not only within the developed countries context? 
thank you. Mindy. Well, I think it's been said. I will reinforce that I am optimistic, maybe because that is our only option. Our kids' future depends on this. So we need to be optimistic and we need to measure that optimism uh, with determination to get there. Government has a very key role to play. Uh, so let's go into the COP with governments having moved financial resources and the right incentives uh, and with the United States rejoining uh, the Paris Agreement, I think we stand a shot at getting there. Thank you. And last but not least, Kate. Thank you. And thank you for this wonderful panel today. So, of course, I'm an optimist. I wouldn't be in this business if I weren't an optimist, right? <laughs> What I would love to see by COP is we need some major statements by industrial ecosystems that progress is underway. I think that the global steel industry, the aviation community, and the shipping industry are all poised to take some major steps within the next 12 months to demonstrate not only commitments to change, but actually some concrete action. So I'm hoping that we can come to COP with some commitments by these ecosystems of actors that'll really set that tipping point going so that we can just continue the momentum over the next decade. Thank you. I think uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. Uh, I really appreciate this panel, some great, uh, great inputs. And so I'll hand back to the studio. Thanks. Thank you. and positivism or just uh, that sense of forward direction. What you can do, I think, is feel a momentum building, even though there are many disparate strands. So thank you very much indeed, Oliver. Let's now move on uh, with uh, our uh, industry partners today, Drax, because of what they're doing and the kind of operations that they have underway. The kind of operations that we're seeing in the northeast of England around the Humber Estuary. And we're joined now live by the Group Chief Executive Officer, uh, Will Gardner, who's also Executive Director of Drax. He's joining me now from New York. Uh, Will, welcome. And uh, what I'd like to do is, first of all, ask you to describe in more detail what is happening on the Humber. We have a graphic here, a three-dimensional graphic, which should help us understand a little more clearly. Great. Well, thank you all for having me, and good afternoon, um, actually, from London. Um, and I, maybe I'll put, start from the idea that uh, with the prime minister's sort of launched his, his uh, 10 point plan yesterday of how the UK might sort of accelerate its route to net zero, which I think was uh, we welcome. And I think there were some exciting things in there about whether it's about electric vehicles and accelerating the transition there. Or what I want to spend most of my time today talking about is about carbon capture and storage. So I, if you've got the, the chart up there, I, we are at at Drax located, we have a large power station located in Yorkshire. There we go, I can see that on the screen now. And so Drax is at, on the left-hand side there. And effectively that, that area which you see there is the Humber Estuary. And the plan that we have, we're part of a group which is called Zero Carbon Humber. And what we would like to do is working with government is put in place carbon capture and storage infrastructure to effectively decarbonize the Humber. Um, very exciting. Yesterday, the Prime Minister committed an additional 200 million pounds to the, the plans that the UK now has to support carbon capture and storage. There's now a total of a billion pounds on the table. And let me tell you sort of the, the three things that need to happen in order to make this a reality. And then I'll talk about what some of the benefits of it could be. So the first thing is that the infrastructure needs to be put in place. So what the government has done is they have encouraged um, industry to work together in clusters. And so you could see on that picture that you have Drax at one end, you have British Steel, for example, is part of our cluster. You have um, SSC, another power company doing gas with CCS, and you would have Hi uh, Equinor, who's going to want to build a hydrogen production facility. So you have industry working together with government to put the infrastructure for carbon capture and storage in place. Right? Second part of the program is we need to put the regulatory framework in place, and we're working with government on doing that in a series of working groups. Um, and then the third thing um, is ultimately, is what do we actually get out of this whole program, right, once we actually have the pieces in place? And I should also mention that one of the things we're working on is the actual technology to do this, right? So we have trials working for doing 
um, carbon capture and storage as do our partners. So ultimately, sort of the benefits of this one is decarbonization. I mean, the Humber is one of the largest um, areas of emissions in the UK, about 10 million tons a year, and we could actually offset most of that with this project of capturing that CO2. Um, the other benefit is jobs, and there's a real connection between building this infrastructure and in the UK what we call our leveling up agenda. The, the government is committed to trying to making sure that the next generation green investment, or what they're now calling a green industrial revolution, is something that it benefits companies across the country. And for example, in the north in the Humber, it's an area where there's lots of heavy industry, so lots of advantages. And um, we commissioned a report that was published yesterday that said this carbon capture and storage infrastructure could lead to about 50,000 new jobs potentially in the Humber. So really could make a significant difference. And if I drop up, I'll sort of talk about three ways in which this infrastructure could be used. So the first is we, it could help Equinor, for example, to actually make hydrogen. So if we capture the CO2 that would come out of their creation of hydrogen um, using steam methane reforming or some other form of uh, reforming, we can create hydrogen, which is another big part of the prime minister's plan. Second thing would be for someone like British Steel to actually use carbon capture and storage to decarbonize. So once that infrastructure in place, they could do that. And then the third piece is what we're doing at Trax is, is negative emissions. And I'd, I'd love to talk more about that in questions, but we generate all of our power using sustainable biomass. So we're effectively the renewable fuel. Um, and if we add carbon capture and storage onto that, we end up with negative emissions, i.e. we're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, we're taking more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we would be emitting. So it's actually reducing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so we could do as much as 4 million tons with one unit, 16 million tons with four units. And the Climate Change Committee in the UK believes that the UK needs about 50 million tons of negative emissions in order to actually achieve net zero by 2050. So we could be a big part of that. And maybe the final point I'll make before we go to the sort of some Q&A is that the, um, all of this needs to start happening now, right? If we actually start making the investments now, if we get the commitments from the government now, we can be in, ready to actually sort of start building infrastructure in 2024 and actually be capturing CO2 in 2027. But if we don't start now, uh, we won't be ready by then. So we, I think there's important to note that there's urgency in doing this. So why don't I pause there and I'm happy to sort of start a, start a discussion. Thanks very much, Will. And let me encourage in the next 15 minutes, any of you to uh, give me some questions, give me some comments as well. Um, quickly, Will, what do the financials look like? Because actually when we were talking about this before, um, a couple of days ago, you talked about the 50,000 jobs, but also 200,000 elsewhere. But what about the multiplier effect that this is now having on industrial and economic development? So fund fundamentally, the, I mean, the, sort of think of the program as having sort of multiple phases. There's a, there's a lot of infrastructure to be built. So between, so let's say 24, 27 into the early part of the 30s, there's a lot of the investment would be in infrastructure. So a lot of those jobs would be in actually sort of building the pipelines, building the carbon capture infrastructure, et cetera, and, those are, and designing it, so good quality engineering jobs, et cetera. Then the jobs will be involved, would also involve you know, operating and maintaining the equipment. The other part of this, which is important, is we keep a lot of those jobs alive, right? So there's about 55,000 jobs which would stay <coughs> Sorry, which we could ma maintain that are actually happening now, which without this would struggle to be decarbonized. Right? But ultimately on an e economic basis, as you say, about 200,000 jobs across the country and as much as 3 billion in gross value add for the UK. <coughs> what about the, uh, I hope you can hear me, uh, Will. What about the financials okay. and the economic prospects now? Because I have a document in front of me from the IEA talking about that uh, uh, reaching net zero will be initially impossible now without CCUS. So I, I think that that's right. I mean, if you look at the, actually what these people are all saying is that we need CCUS to make decarbonization happen. And I actually think that the, the sector by sector approach is key. So, you know, CCUS can help steel, it can help <clears throat> hydrogen hydrogen creation, it can help other cement, other heavy industries, so that's key. The other thing that CCUS will enable is negative emissions, right? which for us we think is a key part of the puzzle as well, because if you think about some of the costs for this, decarbonizing some of the heavy industries like or aviation, for example, people talk about that as being several hundred pounds 
or dollars per ton of CO2. We can do it for significantly less. I mean, we're still working on the details of the numbers, but actually for us to take a ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere and deliver negative emissions, we think we can do that for a fraction of the cost of what it would take to do something like aviation. So we think there's real economic benefits to doing sort of what we're trying to do with uh, negative emissions. And your projections are very clear, are they, are they that this is financially <coughs> sustainable, that the, the financials, the investment will add up, even though at the moment there's a transition to CCUS, and obviously it was put on the back burner, sorry to use that phrase, but put, put, it was receding in popularity, but now there's a very clear commitment to CCUS. So there is a much clearer commitment. And I think my own view is that the reason for that is twofold. One is that the recognition globally uh, that we need CCUS to get to net zero, I think, is becoming um, very strong. And, and the view that we need to do everything that we can to decarbonize is quite clear. Now, the second thing I would say is that, for example, we at Drax had a, pro a project called White Rose, where we were trying to build CCUS infrastructure to support coal. And I don't think people want to do that anymore. We're not trying to first support the continued use of fossil fuels. Right? So using CCUS to decarbonize heavy industry or to create hydrogen or to actually deliver negative emissions, which is what we're trying to do, is a much more, I think, a much more valid use and people are much more supportive of that. So in terms of the numbers, I mean, there will be lots of investment required. So ultimately it will take billions of pounds of infrastructure investment, billions of pounds to support the CCUS, uh, but ultimately, the key thing will be that we have a price of carbon. And ultimately, for example, our vision with negative emissions is if we can have a credit for every ton of CO2 that we capture and store away that's a negative ton of CO2 that matches a forward-looking carbon price. And so, for example, I've seen a report recently from Morgan Stanley that looks at the EU ETS and says that it'll be sort of around the, or their projection. we have it on the order of 100 euros or so in the early 30s. Um, if we get a credit of that nature, we can absolutely make this work. Let me give you some other questions coming in. Um, some of them are about wood, actually. This from Hazel Henderson, <coughs> CEO and Editor-in-Chief of Ethical Markets Media. Um, uh, she asks, will Drax still rely on taking timber from our region in southeast USA and shipping it across the Atlantic and burning it for electricity? A third thermodynamic black hole, worst way to achieve BECs. Our research shows better methods. UK can better use onshore and offshore wind. You're smiling, Will. No, it's because I think there's, there's a lot of people who um, have questions about the best way to use biomass. And I think um, there is, um, there's some legitimate issues there. So if it's not done in the right way, I absolutely think there's challenges there. Um, you know, sending it, you know, bringing it across from the US, there are emissions that are part of that, but they are significantly lower than the emissions that actually are created in, the, in, in what you would get if you use coal, for example. Um, so um, the key thing about biomass, in my view, is if, we, if it's used properly, if you're using as we would do, you're only taking wood from forests that are growing. So it's a sustainable proposition. If you're actually using byproducts, whether that's sawdust, sawmill, thinnings, uh, limbs and tops from the forest, that it actually it's a, it's a good way uh, to use that wood to actually create power. And, and the key thing now is also when we add CCS onto it, so we're doing carbon capture, that actually you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and permanently storing it away. That's a very good, good use of, of that biomass. And what about sequestration? So sequestration, I mean, the, it, the people often ask the question, you know, is it safe? What's the history of it with the technology? Um, and just by way of example, in, in uh, off the north, coast of Norway and up in the North Sea. They've been doing carbon capture and storage for several decades now, and they've been doing it safely. Um, and one of the things that actually is quite useful or beneficial about doing this in the UK is that the geology is quite favorable for doing CCUS off the North uh, East Coast of the country, and, and as well as the expertise. We really have good expertise um, for offshore or you know, managing offshore infrastructure. Um, this from Manjot from Equity Research uh, and Analysis Company, I think Arden Partners. Could you expand on what the role for hydrogen will be in CCS going forward? And is it cost effective enough to adopt hydrogen long term? So 
the um, hydrogen has moved rapidly up the agenda, I would say globally in the last year in terms of being a, a fuel and a source of uh, a fuel, a carbon neutral fuel for heating or for some forms of transport, for example. There's lots of debate as to the best way to create that hydrogen. And I think long term, uh, people would say that green hydrogen is probably the long term solution, i.e. using um, renewable power, whether that's excess wind power sort of in parts of Europe, whether that's excess solar power in other parts of the world to create that hydrogen using electrolysis. And that is still quite expensive. In the meantime, I think there is there are economically viable ways to make what people would call blue hydrogen. So actually splitting out hydrogen from methane. Uh, and actually in the process of doing that, there is a creation of CO2. And that's what that's where the link is between the creation of hydrogen and the carbon capture and storage. So for example, Equinor at the plant that they would intend to build you know, in the Humber, they would actually be creating hydrogen there. And in order for that to be carbon neutral, you have to capture the CO2 that's, that is a byproduct of that process and store it under the North Sea. So that's really where the link is. How much um, has, I know you mentioned it briefly, but how much has yesterday's announcement from the um, UK uh, Prime Minister helped you? Has it, will it, is this going to affect your investment plans and your investment going forward? We are going to be joined within the next hour by Kwasi Kwarteng, who's the Minister for Energy here in the UK, and he wants to talk about decarbonisation. But is there a, is there a, a virtual uh, convergence going on here, which is going to push forward dramatically your ability to take this process forward at a speed which is even faster than you were planning? So effectively, the, the, the key thing, again, I think to talk about is really the two parts of this, right? So the first one is that there's a clear commitment from government and from industry to put the infrastructure in place, right? So there's a combination, I would say, the first billion has now committed is, it, is it this important signal to industry that actually the government is behind this. And that money, I think, will be used to support our sort of initial pre-feed design work for various clusters designing where the carbon capture and storage infrastructure will go. So I very much welcome the uh, Prime Minister's announcement about that funding, and it absolutely will help us continue and potentially accelerate our plans. Right? The second part of this is that the so Quasi and the Energy Ministry has organized several working groups that have been working over the last year to look at what are the business models and the regulations that we need to support important storage on the one hand, carbon capture for industry, carbon capture for, for, for energy production. And those programs are happening, and, and we're looking forward to seeing the output of those next year. And once we have those sort of clear and legislated, then people can start building. How much is this now rep replicable? I hope you're OK there, Will. And you, do you need water or something? I, I can't give it to you across the table from where I am. <laughs> um, but how much of this is now creating a model for you of what can be done elsewhere? So the, um, and maybe I'll go back to the question of a colleague about sort of the best sort of ways and places to do that, right? So the, I think the industrial cluster model, which is sort of industry and government working together to put the infrastructure in place is absolutely replicable. Um, I think the sort of the business models, the way those are evolving are, are effectively, we're looking at taking the model that the UK has built for offshore wind, where you have a contract for difference, i.e. a long-term contract of assured revenue for the output of what you're doing from the government that actually then enables the projects to get built, gives you some revenue certainty. And then as the technology matures, each subsequent generation probably needs less support until it ultimately becomes freestanding in and of itself. I think that's a model that's also quite replicable. But if you look at other jurisdictions, for example, one of the things about BEX, about what we're doing is that a lot of the cost and some emissions, as, as one of the uh, as one of the questions said, come from making pellets and moving them around. Right? Ultimately, for example, for us to do specs in the U.S. could be quite attractive. You do it in the southeast of the U.S. You use residuals from sawmills to generate power. You then capture the CO2 there, and there are a lot. There's already an infrastructure of CO2 pipelines. So actually, doing specs in other parts of the world with an infrastructure that's already in place and with a regulatory system that might be something that sort of replicates what happens in the UK would be very interesting. I've got a question here from uh, Anurag Dayal, Managing Director of Blue Marble. A simple question, will new pipelines have to be laid? 
Uh, yes, a simple answer. Um, so we will have to put in place new CO2 pipelines. So if you go back to that map we showed in the beginning, um, we'll be putting a pipeline from Drax, sort of about 60 kilometers inland through the Humber, and then ultimately about 90 miles offshore. Um, you can see it there, the sort of the thin brown line or sort of around the bottom sort of half of the map. Um, and that's that's a new pipeline that will have to be laid to carry the CO2. All right, one final question. It's just coming in from Benjamin Weston from the Pond Foundation. If we look at carbon emissions as a waste issue, then do you see a role for CO2 offsets whilst developing towards effective CCS, Will? What is your opinion of dealing with historic CO2 issues by the industry? Um, so how do I sort of parse that? If, is the, um, if I maybe sort of take some of those pieces, so offsets, right? So historic offsets, sort of difficult question. I'm not sure I'm gonna get into that, but lots of challenges around how that could work. Um, CO2 offsets for industry, I think, you know, I think going forward, there can be, a, there should be and will be a role for offsets for around CO2. So for example, I'm part of something that's looking at voluntary markets for offsets. And I think there's definitely a role for that. But I know in, as part of the panel discussion that we just had, but lots of issues around verification, lots of issues we need to make sure that whatever offsets are being done, whatever is not sort of something that would happen anyway. Um, so I think there is going to be a role for those, but it's quite um, sort of important to get the details right of how they're managed. What about what you're seeing elsewhere around the world about the political acceptance? Obviously, by chance, actually, we're talking to you today. You've been supporting significantly uh, this forum just the day after there's a big announcement from the UK government committing itself to, to what you are doing. But what are you seeing elsewhere about the way this can be replicated, not just in the UK or across Europe, but elsewhere in the world? So maybe I'll, I'll start with Europe. So there's a big project, uh, again, off the coast of Norway called Northern Lights. So again, it is happening there. And there's there, I think there is acceptance for that. And I would say an important piece of this is that that is offshore storage. I think onshore storage of, of CO2 is, is significantly more controversial. So there are countries in Europe where that is not um, something that is widely accepted. Um, it is happening um, in the US um, and Canada, for example, there are operating carbon capture facilities happening there. Um, a lot of that has been used historically for um, enhanced oil recovery, which again is not is also you know, somewhat controversial. But again, I think we're starting to see um, a lot of interest in the broad idea of what I would call greenhouse gas removal technologies now starting to grow, for example, quite, quite extensively in the US. And that ranges from, you know, I would say at the technology end of the spectrum, direct air capture, um, you know, VEX is sort of in the middle, sort of part technology, part sort of nature um, derived, and then you know, more pure nature-based solutions, which you might call afforestation, reforestation. And how do we harness those greenhouse gas removal technologies to start taking CO2 out of the atmosphere um, in a way that actually gets us to net zero more quickly? We're seeing, uh, there's lots of, interesting, lots of interesting thing happening in the U.S. on that in that area. All right, Will. Will Gardner, the uh, Group Chief Executive Officer and the Executive Director of Drax. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today with that update on where we are. And as I say, you're riding in the crest of a wave, really, uh, after what the British government announced yesterday, but indicating just how profound and, and deep that the progress is on CCUS and also its ability to commit as a multiplier for industry, for jobs, and for so much uh, in the area is around as we've seen and are seeing at the moment in the Humber estuary. Will, thank you very much indeed. We're going to take a break now. Thanks Afterwards, we're going to be joined by Fatih Birol, who's executive director of the International Energy Agency, and also uh, Isabella Lovin, who is the Swedish Minister for Environment and Climate and Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden. That in about 15 minutes, so stay with us.
Welcome back to the Sustainable Innovation Forum with me, Nick Gowing. We're into part two of day four. We've got uh, 75 minutes to run discussing the industry transition, how to decarbonize. Let me tell you that uh, everything we're doing is being recorded. You can always catch up uh, with the recordings uh, on our website and do watch any s sessions on demand. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing very clearly is a pace which is picking up, exactly, very much uh, amplified by what we saw in, uh, here in the UK yesterday with the announcement of the new UK Green Deal and the, the 10 points of the way the British government is going to push this forward. And we're going to be joined shortly by the UK's uh, energy minister, Kwasi Kwarteng. He'll be joining us. Uh, he was going to talk about decarbonisation. Now there's even more reason to talk to him about what uh, extra impetus the, uh, the initiative of yesterday is going to bring. Uh, we'll also be joined by Tata Steel, Johnson Matty and Parital Technologies from Mitsubishi Heavy Industry Group. Plus, uh, after that, we're going to be joined by live by the International Energy Agency's Executive Director Fatih Birol and Sweden's Deputy Prime Minister uh, Isabella Löfven to discuss the market opportunities and the policy regulator interventions. Remember, you can always uh, catch up with us on uh, socials at uh, Climate Action Live, hashtag Climate Action Action Live and hashtag SIF20. But let's move immediately now uh, onto the technological solution for industrial decarbonization and particularly asking the question, is hydrogen going to be the silver bullet? Uh, joining me now, I hope, is uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, the British Energy Minister. I'm going to introduce each of them, each of the speakers, as we go through. Kwasi Kwarteng, welcome. I think you've just stepped out of uh, uh, a parliamentary debate to join us. Welcome. That's Can exactly I ask right. Very, very significantly about decarbonisation. We've just been talking to Will Gardner of Drax, who you know well, he mentioned yeah. you as well, about what is happening on the Humber. This is a global issue, of course, but the, 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 the way that there's a new momentum now building on decarbonisation, how would you clar cl cl clarify it, classify it? So it's, I think it's a huge um, step forward, actually. I mean, one of the things that I think triggered this whole uh, episode was the legislation that we passed last year in Parliament, which essentially mandated a, a zero carbon emissions policy by 2050. And that's really shaped our decarbonisation agenda. And I was told when I became the energy minister for the UK in July last year, 2019, that if without any kind of Chinese buy-in or without buy-in from India, without buy-in from Asia, which is after all where 60% of people on the planet live, uh, we, these targets were futile. And what's happened in the last two months, Nick, is that the Chinese have come out and said that they want to have a net zero uh, country by 2060, albeit 10 years after our date. The Japanese have uh, very quickly after that said that they were going to decarbonize by 2050. And the South Koreans uh, said the same thing a few days later. So there's huge momentum globally uh, for uh, the decarbonization behind the decarbonization agenda. And this is something that we're looking forward very much in the UK to be lead uh, and spearhead in the run up to COP26, which we're hosting in Glasgow next November. So the decarbonization agenda is a global agenda. Um, it obviously is uh, aimed at tackling climate change reducing greenhouse gas emissions and i think it's one of the big movements that's defining global politics today so bluntly i mean what about the financials it's a massive investment with some risk as well what view are you detecting not just in the uk government but around the world about the support for what is needed because this has got to be done at commercial scale so i think that um I don't really see it as a cost. I see it as an investment, which will actually get even better returns. I mean, if you look at where we have uh, traveled from in the UK it, since 1990, that's 30 years. So 30 years time, it'll be 2050, 30 years ago, unbelievably to some, it was 1990. And what's happened since 1990 is that we've managed to grow our economy by three quarters while reducing our carbon emissions by 43%. And so we've shown in this country that it is possible to reduce carbon emissions while growing the economy. Um, strictly, um, you know, people pedantically might say, well, some of those carbon emissions were, were exporting. And that may be true, but the absolute figure of actual carbon emissions is considerably lower 
uh, than, than is the case, even if you count uh, the so-called uh, carbon emissions that we've exported. And yet we've managed to grow our economy considerably in that time. So that's uh, that shows in itself, Nick, that uh, we can grow the economy and we can regard spending in this area as investments. The jobs, uh, the economic opportunities uh, that can be created through green investment were mentioned by the Prime Minister yesterday in his 10-point plan. And many investors around the world uh, see those opportunities. It was very striking, and this is my last point, that only a few weeks ago, Orsted, which is a Danish uh, wind uh, operator, offshore wind operator, um, their market uh, cap was higher than uh, that of BP, which has been around for 120 years or so, and is a major um, oil company, as people know. So the market themselves, the investors themselves, can see that there's great opportunity in the green revolution. And they're abandoning, in some uh, sense, um, many, many of the traditional investments. All right. Well, Minister, I hope you can stay with us uh, with all your other pressures at the moment, because what I'd like to do is go to our other three contributors and go to Mumbai, first of all. But all of you, the same question. Is it clear where decarbonisation can work and how technology can be deployed commercially? That question I put to the minister there about the, the financials in all of this. Let's go to Mumbai first, to Madalika Sharma, who's Chief Corporate uh, Sustainability uh, Officer for Tata Steel. Uh, Madalika, what's your view about where, where this is going on decarbonization? So, uh, yeah, as rightly pointed out, I think uh, decarbonization, uh, I mean, the, it's, a, it's gained a global momentum. Uh, incidentally, today's headline of the leading daily was that India is on track to meet its NDC. Having said that, of course, the it's uh, hinged on largely on the decarbonization of the power sector. Uh, but I think uh, globally, uh, it's making it is gaining momentum. And uh, though I come from a, I represent a developing economy, and there's a lot of ground to be gained in terms of meeting the day-to-day -day requirements, energy requirements, as well as you know other material requirements. And uh, I think uh, the focus is now also changing from power because I guess the technologies for power is known and now the technologies for other sectors especially the heavy industry sector which is you know definitely required for the uh, development of some of these developing economies and also is required for development of some near zero technology so i guess uh, that's the uh, piece uh, we'll discuss also and that's the piece uh, uh, of challenge which uh, continues to be there but what about uh, you you're representing tata steel uh, where the margins are very thin, if you're lucky to make profit yeah. at the moment, and we know the kind of challenges that there is right across the world, including for Tata here in South Wales, for example. But what about the, the expectation that if you move into decarbonization, there's going to be a significant cost? What is going to be the impact on you commercially because of decarbonization? Can you actually afford it? Not on our current uh, balance sheet unless and until, uh, so so while there are some incentives in Europe, uh, there's a carbon tax, there's ETS. Uh, uh, in India, as of now, there are no incentives or no penalties also. And hence, you know, and the customer, steel is a globally traded commodity and there is no, uh, the customer doesn't pay a, a one, you know, dollar extra for a lower carbon steel, at least not in India and not in most part of the economy. So there's no incentive, there's no penalty as of now. But, uh, uh, you know, if we are to whatever based on the current, uh, the technologies which are being talked about or which are being developed, uh, the technology of steel making that is prevalent has been there for the last 200 years and it has been perfected. The efficiencies have been achieved. The safety, uh, you know, standards have been set and the technologies that we are going, we are talking about, they are still, you know, at a pilot stage or at demo stages and the cost that works out in only development of the technology, if you just convert it to into a per dollar kind of a thing would be somewhere about uh, between 150 to 200 dollars, which is much more than the profit margins, which most of the steel companies globally would be making. So it will actually wipe out whatever profit you're making. So uh, that's why I said it's the challenge which the heavy industries, I think, globally are seized with. Uh, some of the policies in some of the economies could be forward looking and there could be incentives for them to invest. Uh, either market incentives or you know policy incentives to invest in development and ramp up for these technologies and i think there has to be a 
global momentum on especially for the heavy industries just like what happened in the power sector uh, the minister just mentioned that 30 years ago you know the uh, emissions would have been uh, you know far higher but i i guess it was again a global kind of a, a scene that got created for uh, investment uh, in the not only in the technology development but i guess the uh, whole you know creation of the supply chain in the production of uh, you know the equipments for renewable energy and then there were also policy incentives by the local governments to make it you know commercially viable or compete with other technologies which were there so I guess this is the same case that is required for heavy industries, which includes uh, steel, cement, uh, chemicals. Uh, I represent steel sector, but I think that's where it is. And it doesn't uh, economically, right. I mean, doesn't make sense. So. All right, Marlika, so thank you very much for the moment. Stand by because we can go to Alexander Fleischhander, uh, the technology officer upstream and head of environmental solutions for business at Prime Metals Technologies. And you're part of the Mitsubishi uh, heavy industry group, very much concerned about, about this area. Uh, Alexander, what, what's your view when you listen to what Madhu has just been saying? Is your view from, the, from heavy industry exactly the same? Well, I would say at least it's very close to... Uh, to, to this view. So one key won't be enough uh, to unlock the door. Uh, unfortunately, there are many, many locks in, installed uh, installed uh, um, on these doors. So for the steel sector, I would say I'm uh, rather optimistic regarding um, that we solve the technological issue. Um, the solutions are almost there. So um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic we so, so sort out that. But coming back to the First of all, the tremendous amount of uh, electric energy that is required for that uh, transformation in in the near future um, that uh, might take a while. And the second one that was already touched also by <coughs> by um, uh, Matalka was uh, uh, regarding the uh, huge investment. And I was just reading a report uh, recently from IEA uh, that. Um, stated that just for the steel sector, just for the steel sector, it will be required 50 uh, billion US dollars each year over the next 30 years. So that ends up in a, at a $1.5 trillion to transform the, the industry, achieving net carbon zero in, in 2050. That's, uh, that's substantial. And uh, as also mentioned before, well, uh, the the, the steel producers are facing a, a double warming, huh? uh, actually very uh, um, bleak business and an increasing carbon price um, that, um, that hits on the, on the other hand. So under this condition, it will be quite tough uh, to, to invest this huge uh, amount of, of money. And uh, I would also agree with, uh, with Kwasi uh, that, uh, who said, well, uh, see it more as an investment. And uh, that's true, but uh, if you can't invest um, and you have to survive till uh, you achieve the return on investment, uh, that might become difficult. Thanks, Alexander. Let's move to Eugene McKenna, Managing Director of Green Hydrogen for Johnson Matty. Uh, Eugene, what's your, what's your perspective uh, on decarbonization here and the way and the speed at which this can now happen? Okay. Uh, well, I'm from quite an old uh, UK company, more than 200 years old. And the roots of this are, uh, I guess, back in the Industrial Revolution, the 18th century. And in all of that time, fossil fuels have had a really good opportunity, uh, along with their inevitable greenhouse gases, uh, to get themselves completely embedded in every aspect of our economy. I guess we could hear that from the previous two speakers um, who find themselves in that position. Uh, we now aim to remove those emissions in a fantastically and ambitious short time frame. So uh, competitive wind and solar, for example, direct to green electricity, are doing a, a really good job in the UK and in many parts of the world at decarbonisation. And that's all being enabled by the right regulation and the right clever business models. Um, however, it's now leaving us with the tricky areas to reach, um, for example, uh, long distance transportation, heavy industries such as steel and even domestic heating and many other areas to be explored as well. Uh, to kind of bring this to life, I'd, I'd pick an example of uh, a project in the northwest of England, the, the HiNet project, 
and it's a great example of what the difficult areas to uh, decarbonize in the industry are and, and really how to get at them. So in this project, um, blue hydrogen is being produced at a massive scale. That's the plan. And it's going to be supplied domestically as well as to uh, transport and industrial uses such as glass and fertilizer manufacture could be steel as well. Uh, the HiNet project, it's one of the most advanced blue hydrogen projects globally, uh, greatly helped by Bayes and uh, kind of uh, advice from government. Uh, and it's a real model of future projects if a business model can be put in place to incentivize private investment. Uh, the UK government's announcement yesterday, it's really certainly uh, another step in a really positive direction in that regard. Now, uh, clean hydrogen as an energy source and a chemical building block uh, is a really important tool in our toolkit that we can use to decarbonize those difficult areas. Now, uh, Johnson Matthey, as I said, 200 year old technology company, and it's got a long history in hydrogen technologies. And so we're, we're really focusing on this problem in, in three ways. Um, so firstly, uh, on the use of clean hydrogen and fuel cells, uh, where we make key components uh, and where heavy duty trucking is not at all amenable to uh, battery solutions. Secondly, uh, enabling the technology for the production of clean blue hydrogen from natural gas with carbon capture and storage. And uh, as in the HiNet project uh, I, I just mentioned where uh, our technology is being deployed. Uh, and finally, um, production of clean hydrogen by water electrolysis, uh, which uh, you know people are, uh, are very keen on uh, philosophically and practically. Uh, and uh, that's green hydrogen. And in that we in Johnson Matthey apply our expertise from uh, decades of fuel cell component manufacture uh, for the development and production of the, the catalyst coated membranes, which are at the heart of uh, the most advanced electrolyzer uh, technologies. So I, I think there are problems uh, and uh, what the, the discussion around steel we just heard illustrates some of those problems. But I think with the right business models uh, to incentivize uh, the deployment of current technologies and to incentivize investment in them and to uh, incentivize making them get better all of the time and in innovation, uh, I think we're on the right path and, and can meet that goal. Thank you, Eugene. Let me go to the minister. Um, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, you want to deploy decarbonization technologies at commercial scale. What you've heard there, admittedly from other countries, um, from Alexandra and also Madalika in Mumbai, is what um, Alexander called the double whammy, the difficulty now of, of heavy industry retaining profit because the numbers simply don't add up. I know you want to talk about CCUS as well, but help us understand how that can be overcome. Um, Look, I, obviously I think, you're looking at it from a British point of view. I'm very, um, I'll be very honest here. I think that if you look at the capitalist process of the last three, 400 years, companies have had to evolve. Okay, companies have risen and fallen. And I think many of the best companies in the next few years will be the ones that have uh, very uh, cleverly and very nimbly adapted to this framework. Because as Madalika is saying, this is a global phenomenon. We've got governments from the UK to China to Japan, all committing to net zero. And I think the companies that uh, can adapt to that most effectively will have a very strong future. And I'm afraid companies that are less susceptible uh, to adaptation in that way will probably uh, not have a, a successful future. It does mean that there will be. But what uh, about some... the issue of commercial scale? What? The sorry, issue of it being done at commercial scale. I'm sorry, Quasi. Well, it can um, be done at commercial deco scale. I mean, if you look at the offshore wind sector, Nick, if we look at the offshore wind sector in this country, when I entered Parliament sh uh, only 10 years ago, it doesn't feel like very long at all. There was practically no capacity whatsoever. Today, we have um, something like uh, 11 gigawatts of installed capacity in offshore wind, and we're hoping to take that to 40 gigawatts in 2030. That has a huge impact in terms of the supply chain, in terms of, I mean, it's essentially a new industry that's been created uh, when none existed uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So I think it re this represents a huge opportunity in terms of wealth creation and job creation. And yes, it is true that companies uh, who don't adapt will, will, feel, will feel pressure. Uh, and I'm sure Madalika understands this. I know that Tata Steel are adapting uh, to this new environment, and I, as, as are many other companies. 
And as um, Eugene said, uh, you know, these opportunities uh, will be encouraged by government and industry understands that things like green hydrogen um, are, are going to be the, sort of the, the energy sources of the future. So I think that this, um, that the, what's implied in the question um, is, is somehow that, you know, the industry won't, won't, won't be able to adapt uh, and that it'll be, it'll be under huge pressure. I, I, I don't accept that. I think very nimble companies will adapt and will be very successful. Industrial companies, I might All right, think. we're getting a lot of questions coming in. Thank you very much, Minister. Let me just put that to Madalika and Alexander. Actually, if you're nimble and agile, you will be able to pull through on all of this. Madalika, is that feasible, given what you were saying about your margins being killed by the need to decarbonize? Uh, yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, I also represent a, a company which is uh, there for more than 110 years. Uh, actually 114 years now. So uh, we would not give up so easily. Uh, challenge is humongous, but uh, we would not give up, uh, you know, that's that's the spirit. And I guess uh, the only point I would like to say while, you know, I, I think it's not uh, individual company problem. And I think uh, this uh, thinking of local, uh, even at, you know, country level, I guess it's not going to solve the problem. So we have to create those. I think there's, there's where the governments come into play to uh, create those, uh, you know, ecosystems or enablers, I'll call them, to bring all the uh, participate, participants into the same, you know, arena and enable so that, you know, everything gets coordinated and, uh, you know, the whole supply chain is created. I'll just take that example of, say, uh, I, I'll take, because wind energy is not so much prevalent in India, but if uh, I, we take solar energy, I think then, uh, and I, if I take example of Indian government, so there was first, you know, they introduced, uh, they first gave subsidies to the uh, uh, to the companies who were putting up these, uh, you know, plants or who were developing the technology for a for a commercial uh, scale kind of a thing. Then they, uh, f then that was the carrot, and then they used the stick for the consumer uh, sectors like you know steel that you have to, unless until you put your own. Uh, renewable power sources you have to uh, you know compensate and you have to buy uh, renewable sources uh, renewable energy which is being put up by these companies at a much higher rate maybe double or even sometimes triple so that's how the right, well, let me, let me got check. In the last 10 years yeah so let me i check think with alexander uh, you you alexander use alexander you use the phrase double whammy um, if you're nimble and agile you should be able to get over that um, even if you're a, a long-standing heavy in industry group. And that's what the minister has said very clearly. You've got to be nimble and agile and accept that there are new realities. Yeah, well, uh, what I uh, was saying first was uh, uh, for the steel producers. Uh, uh, we are an international plant builder, uh, so we clearly see the opportunity uh, in this transformation because it will require large uh, uh, volume of investments uh, that uh, that will help uh, all the plant builders. But I would say what, what, what is really required uh, to overcome all these hurdles is uh, the industry requires predictability. And uh, I would say that there, there, there is still room left um, um, for further discussion. Meaning at the end, we, we need to cast a solid uh, mid and long term um, energy and hydrogen CCS uh, uh, strategy. Um, uh, steel is, is, is a global commodity, um, so it, it has a certain price level. Um, and if we uh, look on the certain um, countries around the world or regions, the, the conditions are, are, pretty, um, are pretty different. Yeah? In, in, in China, which reflects uh, actually 55% of the total steel production of the world, about 90% is produced via the traditional blast furnace BUF route, which emits much more CO2. So highly appreciated was China uh, was uh, what China was announcing recently to become uh, net zero in 2060. But this will be will be a challenge. Still, still. Uh, um, um, uses about 75% uh, of the total energy source is still fossil based. Um, so that's a huge, uh, a huge amount. Huh? Um, so meaning at the at the end, the predictability I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking about is uh, is the is the energy available in sufficient amount with a stable grid, 
will the hydrogen be there? And at the end, at which price level will it be there? Uh, as if an investment is made in, in our sector, that will last for 40, 50 years. So that's what I mean about predict predictability. Nobody is going to invest five, six billion euro into a transformation uh, just uh, on, on a bet. All right. Well, let me pick up. Uh, we want, I'll come back to hydrogen in a moment, but I've got a lot of questions here and I want to get it through as many as possible. Um, one of the issues, of course, is carbon prices. And this is for the minister, Kwasi uh, Kwarteng. Carbon prices, how much does the minister feel this will help develop CCUS? How will carbon prices affect these new industrial hubs? That from Adrian Gregory, the sustainability pilot, more consultancy. Well, of course, carbon pricing is... Um extremely important. I mean, if we look at how we managed to get um, coal and, and fossil fuels off the um, electricity uh, generation grid, um, that was very largely through carbon pricing. And I suspect, obviously, we haven't come to the conclusion of this, but I suspect, you know, we will see a, a form of uh, carbon pricing, or if you want to think of it this way, carbon rationing, uh, in terms of a, either a trading scheme or potentially even a tax. Um, that will that will certainly shape our energy uh, offer uh, in the uh, once we leave the EU at the end of this year. Uh, what about um, hydrogen? Let's move on to that because um, that that has already come up. And let me ask Alexander and also uh, Eugene this: uh, What price will hydrogen be competitive in steel production? First of all, Alexander, but that broadens it out to, to to the viability of hydrogen and when it becomes very attractive, given the enormous investments that are going to have to be made. Alexander. Yeah, well, uh, Nick, uh, that will strongly depend on the carbon pricing at the end. Uh, considering the actual carbon price levels in the ETS uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, between 25 and 30 euros per tonne, um, uh, hydrogen would become competitive at uh, around $1 per kilogram. Uh, and the, the, uh, if we, we just look on, on the price level of electrolysis today, uh, in Europe, we are at around four or five, so five to five, uh, four to five fold of the price compared to coal or coke in, in, in steel making. So that will, uh, that requires definitely um, subsidies. Uh, otherwise, uh, without this compensation, it, it can't work. Yeah. All right. Um, what about Eugene? Hydrogen. Yeah, well, I, I guess I, I could say uh, that um, hydrogen pricing is, of course, only one part of the equation. Um, I, I think uh, if we look at, for example, uh, BP's recent energy outlook, they were premising carbon prices uh, from around 30 today, uh, you know, up to 100 by 2030 and $250 a tonne carbon dioxide uh, in the future thereafter, which would completely change the, the, the field of play for attempting to produce uh, materials like steel by by standard processes. So indeed, hydrogen is um, uh, much more expensive today than it can be in the future. And certainly we see green hydrogen uh, taking 80% of its costs out over the next 10 years. Uh, blue hydrogen uh, is uh, al already much uh, cheaper than that. And I think the right regime of uh, subsidies uh, incentives to improve the technology and carbon pricing will drive down uh, both the um, so uh, you know it's the uh, the twin approach of of carrot and stick incentives to get uh, the transformation going and a carbon tax if you like to level the playing the playing field um, because the emitted carbon is currently something that uh, is is not paid for it uh, emitted into the atmosphere and uh, and we all pay the consequences for it so it's a uh, it's uh, tax free at the moment and when that's taxed i think it will change the level playing field in fact i think probably a lot of the considerations here um think about if we think about um, heavy industry like steel in the same business model that we have today it is indeed the case that it doesn't work uh, to clean it up but with the right incentives and business model in place that will drive uh, the behaviors and the innovation that will make clean steel in, in this case possible in my view right let me move on to another issue um, about skills and uh, the resources and the capacities and capabilities that are going to be needed, uh, particularly in supply chains. 
um, about, about the enabling of everything we're talking about. We are those who are able to spend time at these kind of conferences. But what, Minister, do you think is the challenge there for actually developing the skills? We heard from Drax that they've developed about 50,000 jobs in the northeast of England around the Humber estuary. But what are you seeing in terms of the planning, the broadening of the capacity to handle the enormity of this decarbonisation? Nick, I think this is one of the big uh, challenges of the uh, of this whole process. I mean, I was very pleased to announce and to take part in what we call the Green Jobs Task Force. And this is a joint initiative between uh, Bayes, my department, and the DFE, which is the Department for Education. But why we, we uh, started this initiative was that we realised that there's a huge gap uh, in terms of uh, getting people with the requisite skills uh, not just uh, in terms of offshore wind and new, te new relatively new technologies, like solar, but also you know more seemingly mundane uh, things like installing you know the right heat pump in a, in a house, uh, plumbing skills, uh, some uh, you know electricity, electrical skills as well. If we're talking about batteries and storage, so this is a huge area of um, of innovation. And we're very conscious of the fact that we need a workforce that is um, has the requisite skills to deliver this very ambitious program. And it's something that we're working uh, on uh, very closely. And on supply chains as well. Well, that's absolutely relevant to the supply chain. I mean, that's all these jobs, most of these jobs will be in the supply chain. Um, they won't all be, if, if we look at the power industry, not all the jobs will be actually physically generating power. A lot of the jobs will be in uh, people building wind turbines, for example, for um, offshore wind or um, building uh, monopiles, uh, which um, the wind turbines are fixed on. So there's a huge range of industrial opportunities. And many of these products are, are new products. And as um, Eugene was suggesting, we're going to, in order to try and reduce costs, we're going to have to innovate in, in, in our production processes, not just in terms of the sources of, of energy, but also the materials that we use. So there's a constant um, evolution uh, in, in terms of innovation and the kind of skills that you need. And that's something that the government uh, in the UK is very, very aware of. Madhulika, do you see that as a problem too in India and everywhere else that Tata Steel is operating, actually having the skills and having the adaptability and the ability to reskill, apart from anything else, of those who are used to producing steel in a certain way? Yeah, so uh, it was mentioned by Alexander also that the capacities, uh, current capacities that you build, they are very capital intensive and they are there. You should ideally be there for 25 to 40 years. And uh, so just switching off to hydrogen uh, one day uh, is not going to happen. So a lot of uh, retrofitting of the assets needs to be done. And some part of it, Alexander mentioned that, you know, you have to invest in the retrofitting upgradation of your existing assets. Uh, but I think that's a challenge which the industry will solve on the uh, on the skill part or on the supply chain part. Again, I'll go back that. Uh, See, for India, I think uh, hydrogen is the answer. As a country, we are we import. I think we may be the biggest importer of uh, you know fossil fuels. Uh, large part of it is oil and gas, and uh, we are rich in solar energy, and we can actually harness that to reduce our dependence on the uh, you know fossil fuel based energy. And I think that's where I see that as an opportunity for the country, and I think the government also sees that as a, that as an opportunity. I mean, we have been talking to lot of forums within the government and within the and we see that hydrogen uh, and there's a lot of work which is happening and i guess hydrogen is the answer for not for the sector but for the industry for the for the country and but of course the supply chain hydrogen is not something that you can you know transportation transport it to very long distances as of now with the technologies available so you need to redefine the clusters the user clusters which are there so uh, traditionally the steel was our plant is located very near to the iron ore mines, but you know where will it be located? All these things are going to come into play. On the skill part specifically, I think uh, again, I think as a country, India is uh, very you know it, it is uh, actually poised to take the lead in this technology, not only development but being a supplier of this technology uh, for the rest of the world. So. Can we, in the last few minutes, look forward to COP26? 
about what has to be done on decarbonization. What are the two or three things in your mind of what has to be done? Um, and we'll come to the minister in a moment because obviously he has a key role in what's going to happen in COP26 exactly a year from now. But what are the kind of things that the three of you, the other speakers, believe must be put on the agenda where there's got to be real drive um, on, on the issues of decarbonization? Eugene. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'd say clearly COP26 is a, a staging post en route to the, the journey over the next 10 years, but a, a, a very important one. Um, so I think over the next year, there's a lot of scope to uh, think about uh, putting real targets along with real plans on the table. Um, so I think that uh, kind of goodwill and good intentions are, uh, it's fantastic to see those. Also targets long into the distant future are fantastic to see people um, signing up to. I think there's the opportunity to get really pragmatic about what happens next, uh, that we can see progress in the next, you know, two, five, 10 years, uh, not just through to 2050. Alexander. Uh, well, I would say uh, a quite well thought, consistent strategy, starting from uh, the um, energy generation downwards to the finished uh, to the finished uh, product. So in this case, uh, steel, and it, it 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 will start in the strategy uh, with um, uh, process optimization, and this will continue. Uh, this, there's still a potential of uh, about thirty percent uh, to decarbonize, and at a certain point when sufficient renewable energy and hydrogen, either blue or green, is available, uh, then for sure the hydrogen will play and has to play the key role. There are only two ways to produce steel. So to at the end, um, to um, uh, take out the oxygen from the iron ore, the one is coal, the other one is hydrogen. No other way left. Uh, so either we succeed uh, with, with hydrogen or we have to accept a certain um, uh, carbon emission forever. Madlika. So uh, what we would be looking forward in the COP26 from, I'm again coming from in that, from the country specific, uh, you know, uh, thing is that uh, India's NDC uh, is largely hinged on the, uh, you know, energy sector. I think they need to broad base it to accommodate the other you know sectors which are important for the country to uh, move from a developing to a developed economy and have some sectoral you know goalposts also uh, along with you know the power sector which is there so that's i think uh, for india's uh, you know a revised ndc which should be put on the uh, put on the agenda Minister, when you, when you look and when you talk to your ministerial and public servant colleagues in, in Whitehall, where do, where do you see the anxieties about what might not be delivered on decarbonisation? Or do you believe that there is already a significant momentum, a significant momentum which is unstoppable, irreversible and will pick up even greater traction in the next 12 months? Minister, you may be on mute. If you may be on mute. I am. I am. Can you hear me now? Can yes, you hear can. Me now? Would you start your answer, yeah. please? Please start yeah, your so, answer. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with you, Nick, when you say talk about the momentum. And I just wanted to pick up uh, what I said at the beginning of my remarks uh, nearly an hour ago. There's a huge momentum behind uh, what we're doing in terms of decarbonisation in a global community. Um, I cannot say enough how significant... Uh, China's commitment to net zero uh, in 2060 years, and how significant uh, Japan and South Korea's commitments are. And that's one of the things that we want to be doing in COP, is to try and raise uh, the nationally determined uh, contributions of the participants, the, the sovereign nations in the, involved in the, in the conference. And I think that there is a huge momentum, not only uh, from uh, the power generation, which Metalika was mentioning, but also in terms of trying to decarbonize other aspects of our lives. It's for, for example, in, in the homes and heating and housing, uh, and also in transport. I mean, one of the most significantly uh, talked about uh, points of the Prime Minister's 10 point plan yesterday was uh, his remarks about electric vehicles. So I think there are all aspects of our lives um, 
which will be affected by decarbonisation. And I think there's a huge momentum behind that effort. Huge momentum. Are there those who talk about it but don't really believe they can deliver, though? Are you sceptical about some of the commitments you hear, Minister? Yes, I mean, you know, when, when people and politicians say things, obviously one can view what they say with a, a, a deal of scepticism. But I think um, we can't, you know, look at the glass and, and say it's half empty all the time. The fact, the mere fact of China saying that we're going to have, we're going to reach net zero by 2060 is hugely significant. I mean, you may question their motives for saying it, you may question their ability to deliver. But the Chinese government was under no pressure whatsoever, really to come up with this uh, target and it did so voluntarily and spontaneously and i think that's something that we can celebrate and it shows uh, i believe i take them at their word i think that they do want to decarbonize i, do, I think that this idea that they don't want to leave a cleaner china to their children and their grandchildren i think is rather condescending of course they want to um, improve the, their environment and, and make sure that they hand down a, a healthy um, country uh, to their to their um, to their offspring that's a natural human um, right. well, design. So I take people at their word. Well, look, I think people do want to decarbonize and they do want to fight climate change. Um, and I think there's, as I say, there's a, it's a, it's an interesting time because people are very focused on uh, on this on this goal. Well, over my shoulder is a clock. You can't actually see it because the camera is not quite wide enough. Which starts at seven years and forty-two days. And I put it that that we put up there because. That is when we run out of the budget for carbon. And that's in 2027, mm. not 2030. And all of you, um, that's why I'm asking the question, because is there a danger that in order to meet, allowing for the, the COVID implications on, the, on economies and so on, is there going to be a tension between meeting growing demand for products while also meeting the Paris Agreement goals? In other words, a tension because we need to expand economies and the, the expectation will be, well, we'll, we'll leave decarbonisation to a later date. Do you see that the political reality of this, and maybe I can come to, uh, to Eugene first and all three of you and then go to the minister last, do you see that kind of tension emerging, that even if that's what we need to do for the climate emergency, the economic realities post-COVID or with COVID are going to be really rather sombre and sinister? Quickly, Eugene, if you can. Well, I, I think the uh, world needs to rebuild now post COVID and it has a choice and it can rebuild uh, green. If you have hydrogen and if you have green carbon dioxide, you can make everything that you can make from oil. So new stuff that people want, new consumer goods. The, the room around me is built of petrochemicals. It can also be built of carbon dioxide and hydrogen in a green way. So I think with the right incentives, the world can head off in the right direction now. Alexander, you know, even if we know what needs to be done, and we're hearing optimism around the table here, there is a reality here of the economic constraints that have emerged because of COVID, which could make this really very, very difficult. Yeah, uh, I do agree. But uh, at the end, I'm, I'm positive, really positive that we, we will achieve the, the targets. Um, and if you ask, well, um, is, is there the, the danger of, uh, of tension? I think we need some tension. Huh? Uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy goal to meet. Uh, so tension is good. Uh, it's important that all work closely together. So sorry from the politicians, the, the, the public finance, the private finance and the, uh, and the industry. So we have to, uh, as I said, uh, to well, uh, think about a consistent uh, strategy, the solutions, um, and go step by step to achieve the 2050 uh, target at the, at the end jointly. And one, uh, one issue is if I say, well, there's an increasing uh, requirement for, for all the materials. But at the, the, the other hand, we have to recognize the material efficiency. That's one important point. Uh, just look on light, lightweight vehicles and all these issues. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the speed of acceleration of, of uh, material production will, um, uh, will go down. Thank you. Madalika, quickly, if you can. So I think uh, personally, I think that COVID has, uh, you know, uh, I'll take it as an opportunity uh, because it has really shown that we can live with, uh, you know, it's a new normal which has been created. We can live with less. And also, uh, you know, we have got used to more cleaner air, cleaner water. 
you know greener environment so i guess the you know awareness and the uh, sensitivity on these things has been built public in a you know kind of a it was not a good thing good way to happen but it has happened and i think uh, any solutioning which will happen uh, will while it will uh, look at you know meeting the uh, concerns of the economy but in a much more greener way i think so thank you very much madalika and finally minister uh, do you do you fear that um, given that uh, decarbonization sustainability it's quite tough with the public opinion to get that over at the moment that that could be a constraint on achieving this or is there a sufficient engine room and momentum at the moment nick i don't recognize the world that you do i mean you one sees headlines in the newspapers but you know i've stood in five general elections the 2019 election the most recent one was the only one where this issue came out actually out on the doorstep and i think you're quite right to say that there is it, it, there is some skepticism but there's a great deal less than was the case even just five or ten years ago so i think that the, the currents are going the right way i think as um alexander said i think it's good that there is attention i don't think this is an easy thing to do um but at the same time i think there is a real ambition uh, to rebuild the economy in a greener and more sustainable way everyone i speak to in europe and outside europe um are talking about um the green recovery and we didn't talk about the green recovery i'm going to have to dash i'm afraid thank yes, you indeed. very much i was going to thank you anyway thank you uh, minister quasi kwateng thank you very much indeed the uk minister thank for energy thank you uh, and uh, eugene alexander and uh, madalika thank you very much indeed and thanks for sparing time in your busy schedules much appreciated bye bye thank you bye bye, bye. thank you everyone now let's move on because um, how is uh, how is the international community seeing uh, this? Uh, what is going to be done with creating the right market conditions for low carbon heavy industries to flourish? I hope I'm joined now by two leading speakers, uh, Fatih Barol, who's the executive director of the International Energy Agency, and Isabella Lovin, who is the Swedish Minister for Environment and Climate and Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden. Welcome to you both. Uh, let me ask you, Fatih Barol, wh when you look around, and we've spoken many times uh, in the last two or three years, do you see a significant forward momentum at the moment? Because I look at some of your documentation recently from the IEA, uh, and um, there's one from September, reaching net zero will be to virtually impossible without CCUS, for example. In other words, there's got to be significant change in much when it comes to innovation and coming up with new ideas. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, greetings to you and uh, Madam Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, 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 Nick, we are seeing in some parts of the world and in some sectors a great momentum. Uh, which sectors? Mainly in the power generation, electricity generation. Solar and wind are growing very, very strongly. When you look at, for example, this year, 2020, 50% of all new power plants built in the world are solar. Other 50%, uh, everything has put together. So 50% solar, 50% nuclear, coal, gas, everything put together, and solar again, 50%. Why it is happening? For two reasons. Governments are giving a support. But also, solar is becoming the cheapest source of electricity generation in, uh, in uh, many, many countries around the world. And as such, I believe it is not wrong to call solar as the new king of global electricity markets. But electricity alone, even if it decarbonizes the entire power system, it can help us to go the way to reach Paris targets about the one third of the way. There are still at least two major areas that we have to decarbonize. One of them is the industry sector. The other one is the transportation sector. And here we have to come up with the solutions which are not only renewable solar and wind, but also beyond that and here carbon capture and storage and hydrogen can well play a role. When we open the newspapers, 
we read every day the news about the cars, electric cars, this car, the, the fuel cells and the others. But I give you one number, Nick. The three heavy industries, iron steel, cement and chemical alone, these three, the emissions coming from these three is equal to all the emissions from all the cars, trucks, buses, and everything in the world. Forget the cars, but all of them, all the road transport transportation in the world is equal to these three heavy industries. And you cannot decarbonize the heavy industries only or mainly with solar and wind, you need other technologies. And I stop here. Thank you very much, Fatih. Um, let's go to Isabella Lovin. Uh, you're from the Green Party, your Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, and um, are you seeing a significant change underway, um, given that you uh, have been Minister for International Development as well, and Minister for the Environment? Are you seeing a significant shift underway with the kind of responsibilities that you have as Deputy Prime Minister? Well, uh, thank you, Nick, for, for that important question. And uh, of course, uh, f during the last uh, six years in Sweden, we really uh, put the, uh, the, the groundwork for a, a climate transition in our economy. And I think what you need in order, I think Faith Birol is really pointing to a very important point when it comes to the Swedish economy, and that is the heavy industry. We also have one third of the emissions in the transport sector, one third in, in the industry. And in order to really uh, reduce the emissions in the industry sector, we need three things. We need uh, a policy framework uh, to really make uh, the predictability that is necessary for the industry to make the, the huge investments that they need in order to make uh, technolo technological leaps and find new ways of producing steel, cement and chemicals, uh, just as was mentioned earlier. Uh, but we also need finance. Uh, so the, in, our government has really supported uh, the uh, co-financing of uh, pilot plans, of research innovation, and really facilitating uh, certain um, uh, steps that need to be taken for these heavy industries to really uh, make this uh, transition into fossil-free production. And thirdly, we also need cooperation. I, I, I could really um, say this by shorthand, by three F, so we need we need a framework, we need finance, and we need uh, also friendship. So we have created a platform called Fossil Free Sweden, where the uh, and uh, the state and also academia can work together to, uh, to create the enabling uh, environment that is needed for the, the heavy industry to make these transitions. And um, also we see the concrete results now. So in Northern Sweden, we have the first, uh, I think the first in the world uh, pilot plant of uh, producing ste green steel by using hydrogen uh, in the process, green hydrogen from renewable energy. Uh, instead of using coal in uh, in the um, process of producing steel. And this is something that we really see uh, a great potential for uh, when it comes to our export industry. And uh, basically, this is the way to work that we're trying also to promote through international cooperation. Fatih Barol, um I'm looking at one of your reports from July 2020 in which it, you say very clearly, we must understand the scale of the innovation challenge. What is clear is there's a lot of good technology out there. There's a lot of money as well, but the two are not really joining up yet, particularly on hydrogen, um, particularly on some technologies. Do you see this as quite a constraint given the speed at which this kind of uh, the, the advances have to be made? Uh, uh in, in, in Nick, I should tell you the following. So everybody talking about the 2050 net zero. I think Sweden, Europe, uh, Japan, Korea, China talks about 2060, uh, Canada uh, and many countries. 
we look at the uh, emission reductions needed to reach 2050 net zero. And 50% of the emission reductions need to come from technologies which are not ready for the markets yet, which are not commercial yet. So how are we going to 2050, when you look at the energy sector, energy sector is not like an IT sector. Things go from one day to another. It takes time. It is a uh, slow-moving. Uh, uh, the capital stock turnover is much uh, slower in the energy sector. So how we can get the technologies which are not market ready yet, making commercially available. Here, for me, one critical issue, the role of governments. This mm. is extremely critical because, as you said, money is definitely there, the capital is there, but governments need to make sure that the money goes to the areas in these technologies where the businesses think it will be a profitable investment. Otherwise, it will not go by itself. We cannot rely on the goodwill of the CEOs or the shareholders. Governments need to make sure that the investing in hydrogen, investing in carbon capture and storage, investing in the storage, electric battery storage, will bring them uh, 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 benefits, profits, and it's a profitable strategy. This is, the investment framework is very important, and plus, I would say, governments coming with some mandates, for example, when we talk about hydrogen, with some mandates is uh, important. To sum up, I believe the, the governments, our fate, our destiny, whether or not we reach our climate targets, lies in the hands of the uh, governments uh, today. But candidate technologies are there, money is there, governments need to make it uh, happen, uh, in my view. And, yes, indeed, and, and in one of your reports, you say, without, without a... Find the, since I have the Deputy Prime Minister here, a compliment to Sweden, Sweden is definitely one of the role models that the, all the countries uh, need to look very closely and the role of government there. Well, let me, uh, let me ask the Deputy Prime Minister then, what is it about your Swedish policy, uh, for you as a Green politician, what is it about the, the Swedish policy, which uh, Fatih has just uh, paid tribute to, what is it that other countries could follow about the government commitment in this, given the enormity, whether it be infrastructure for electric vehicles, or it be um, the kind of funding that's going to be financing and initiative that's needed for hydrogen? What is it about what Sweden has done, which other countries could follow? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, what we really established uh, already back in 2016, we started to work with uh, the parties in our parliament uh, to agree upon a climate law and a climate policy framework to establish that we, as a country, should re reach net zero emissions by 2045. So this has really created the stability, the predictability for industry, that we have a cross-party agreement in the Swedish parliament that this is where we're going. We're going to have reached net zero emissions by 2045. And we also, uh, of course, understand that we can't reach that by uh, asking our industries, our heavy industries, to move from our country, uh, but we must make sure that they can find the technical solutions in order to get to a, uh, a carbon-free production. And we're very, I mean, we're very dependent on our heavy industries. And the steel industry in Sweden, for instance, it uh, accounts for 10% of our emissions, but it also accounts for a lot for, for our economy. So what we did was also First, we established the climate law. Then we also established a co-financing mechanism called the Industrial Leap, where the Swedish uh, state is co-financing pilot plants, research, innovation. And we set this long term, so up until 2040, 
uh, we're going to continue co-financing uh, these types of, of um, innovation and industrial technology leaps that we need to see in order to, to make it possible for our heavy industry to make the transition. And, and also we continue to be open with a dialogue with the, the industries and we encourage them to sit down and really uh, uh, give us their own roadmaps how do they see uh, how the transition for zero emissions by 2045? Not asking them if they can do it, but asking them how can you do it? And this was a, a process of a couple of years, but now we actually have 22 roadmaps from different sectors of the Swedish economy, uh, accounting for more than 70% of our total emissions that produce their own road roadmaps. Uh, and uh, identifying the, the obstacles uh, for them uh, and also what they need in, in, in terms of, of resources, finance, research, cooperation between different sectors. And now we're kind of putting all these roadmaps together as a giant uh, jigsaw puzzle uh, where we're going to see what is the, the picture when we are a fossil free country, which is the ultimate goal of uh, the Swedish government. And, uh, and this has really changed the mentality also in our private sector and in our business sector, going from being very reluctant and saying that, well, uh, if we have this very uh, harsh uh, um, uh, demands uh, from the Swedish government, then uh, life will be very, very difficult for us. And now we have a total transformation where they are asking us now, come on and, and deliver on our roadmaps and we can actually do it. And we feel a lot of enthusiasm from uh, the Swedish business sector. And uh, just to, to, to finish, um, just I want to mention also that now Sweden leads together with India, uh, a platform called Lead It for the heavy industry uh, for for countries, but also for, for businesses to join. And we have 30 um, different partners and, and participants in, in the Lead It uh, platform. Uh, some very important, big, uh, um, heavy industries, uh, but also countries such as Australia, Argentina, South Korea, India, and, and uh, several European countries where we try to share best practices, uh, also supporting the creation of these types of roadmaps and how governments can support industry in doing the transition. And I think that's the absolutely only way to do it, because if we just legislate, that would not do the trick. We have to legislate. We also need to give the resources, but also create the spaces for cooperation and enabling environments. I wonder how many other countries would, would move in that direction. We have about seven minutes left, so let me just move on if I can quickly and do, do pose questions, uh, but I don't really have any significant questions at the moment. Uh, Fatih Barol, I'm quoting from your, um, from your news bulletin from September, literally five or six weeks ago. Um, Reaching net zero will be virtually impossible without CCUS. When you think back a few years ago, carbon capture and storage was seen as not just unfashionable, but um, not really operational. This is, but for you to say reaching net zero will be virtually impossible without CCUS, how is that going to be, be achieved? We've been hearing from the Drax um, uh, operation on the east coast of England. We heard from Will Gardner, their chief executive and operating director, uh, about what is happening there, creating jobs, but also shifting carbon capture well out into the North Sea. Is this a significant change underway now? So uh, uh, you are right. This is from a report uh, we made on CCUS and which I released to international press with the Norwegian Prime Minister, Mrs. Uh, uh, Solberg. Now, why CCUS? To be honest with you, I have uh, no interest neither in CCUS nor in this or that, my issue is reducing the emissions. And when we look at the world today, uh, still 80% of the global energy comes from fossil fuels. And when we look at the future, 
uh, especially in the Asian countries, emerging world, there is a huge amount of locked in infrastructure. Let me tell you this, uh, uh, Nick. Even as of tomorrow, if we built everything in the world, power plants, cement, iron, steel, everything, zero fossil fuels, only the ones we have now, the coal power plants, in uh, iron, steel, aluminium, if they continue to operate with the normal working conditions, how many years they have uh, economic lifetime, 30, 40 years, the global temperature only from the existing ones, forget the new ones, if everything new is uh, zero emissions, the global temperature will increase 1.65 degrees Celsius. So we miss our uh, climate course uh, by far. The way, the way to reduce the emissions there is CCUS is a very important opportunity to find a solution between the fossil fuels and our climate course. And what I see in the year 2020, when all the investment in the energy sector are drying up, we see more than $4 billion investment in CCUS. UK came up recently with a new plan in addition to Norway, a big plant in the longship uh, project of uh, Norway, I uh, expect very strongly that the next U.S. administration will build upon the uh, CCUS uh, uh, trajectory and CCUS will be one of the key enabling technologies to reach our uh, climate goals. For me, technologies are not important. Important is if and how they reduce the emissions and CCUS can play a role there. Now, uh, can I ask you both this question in the final five minutes? Um, uh, um, Deputy Prime Minister, we will have a new president from the 20th of January in the United States. How much is that going to be critical? This is not just a political question. It's about a mood being created, which is rather different from the last three and three quarter years. How important is that now going to be to move forward on decarbonization, to move forward on so many of these critical issues where there's been foot dragging and there have been obstructions on the path. Um, Madam Deputy Prime Minister, what's your view about whether this is going to be a significant change of mood and generation of momentum? I think, uh, I think absolutely we're seeing a, a, a major shift in moods and, and uh, the EU has been very much alone during the last four years in uh, being a leader on climate and uh, of course it matters a lot uh, if it's only the EU that is trying to uh, Hate, make uh, the ambitions uh, being more ambitious or if we have uh, a tandem with uh, with the US and now we also have um, from uh, from China from Japan from South Korea their um, ambitions of reaching net zero by the mid-century and that is of course also very very important but it has been a struggle during these four years and I, I have to be very honest about that of course it's very difficult uh, for to convince uh, some countries that they should be ambitious in in um, to the climate transition when they see uh, the US one of the major emitters and the biggest emitter uh, historically uh, withdrawing from the Paris agreement and, and not saying that they will live up to what they uh, should do uh, according to what what is uh, in the in the Paris agreement so it's a major shift and very welcome can you feel a mood can you quickly can you feel a different mood as well and I'll ask Fatty Barol this same question do you feel already a different mood a kind of release going on well on, if on you the ask me issue, yes on sustainability yes indeed the answer was yes, yes I think. Yes, of uh, course. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. And Fatty Barol, I mean, in the end, you don't get involved in politics. You're in the business of climate and energy. But what, what can you reflect? Because this is an important moment to um, sense which way practically things are achievable now. 
What can you reflect on what's happened since November the 3rd or November 5, 6, 7? Now we have a decisive uh, response and uh, outcome in the United States. I expect that the next U.S. administration uh, uh, will give a tremendous momentum uh, for clean energy transitions. And uh, I would expect that this will be in different uh, forms in terms of uh, pushing further the existing clean energy technologies such as renewables, but also uh, small modular reactors, the nuclear power. There will be a close look at the regulations from methane emission regulations to energy efficiency regulations and putting in context of the forum, United States has been the main driver of innovation years and years and I would expect that for the new technologies, United States uh, will be a key driver of clean energy innovation. To finish, uh, Nick, uh, what I would say is that different countries may have different clean energy technology options. Some of them like solar, the other one like wind, the other one like uh, nuclear or hydrogen or uh, CCUS. For me, I really do not care. Important, is, important thing is not to increase our egos, but to reduce the emissions. So I am looking forward to that. <laughs> not to reduce egos, but not to, to increase egos, but not to in increase emissions. That's fantastic. Thank you both very much indeed. I have to say I'm sitting here. I don't know if you can see me, but with this clock, which says that this seven years, 42 days, that's 2027, is uh, when we will reach the limit of our budget uh, for carbon emissions. And uh, that's well before 2030. So it underscores the urgency of everything being discussed here at the Sustainable Innovation Forum. Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, thank you very much indeed for joining us. And also Fatih Barol from the International Energy Agency. Much appreciate you, you sparing time for us. And uh, that's it uh, for today, for day three, of, day four, I should say, of this um, Sustainable Innovation Forum. Uh, let me... Uh, underscore that uh, our, our partners have been Drax, they have been Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Group, uh, GHD Sat, and Johnson Matthey as well. What's coming up tomorrow? We start again at 1.30 GMT, that's 2.30 Central European time, or you can work out whichever part of the world you're in. We're going to be discussing land use and digital agriculture. How do we accelerate the fourth agricultural revolution. The highlights tomorrow, we're going to be having a live interview with COP25 climate action champion uh, Gonzalo Munoz, a very special session with His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales here in the UK, uh, and opening remarks from the UN Food and Agricultural Organization's Director General. And we'll be closing with an interview uh, from California with the Governor of California, Gavin Newsom, reflecting on the recent US elections, how California, with all its troubles recently over the fires and the other significant environmental challenges, particularly what he said was due to climate change, how California is going to be adapting to the new federal presidency of Joe Biden and, and the kind of urgency that there is coming down the track. So that's all tomorrow at the Sustainable Innovation Forum here. And we start at 1.30 Central European, 1.30 GMT and 2.30 Central European time. So from me, Nick Gowing, thanks for being with us. Thanks for all our speakers as well. And join us again tomorrow for day five of the Sustainable Innovation Forum. Bye-bye.
a leader in manufacturing and engineering technologies, spanning numerous industries, delivering real solutions so together we move the world forward. Thank you.